Oh, at least we've got a cool logo. All right, this is gonna be tricky. The Saints. We call ourselves the Saints. Maybe we should start at the beginning. Hello, I'm Snake. I've been into Saints Row from the start. I suppose you could call me Old Testament. Liked one, loved two, felt let down by the third when they dropped the balance of silly and seriousness harder than Johnny, then just kind of placidly liked four. Feeling that frustration of when a series is no longer what you wanted in it, but the resignation that it isn't all bad. Hey, at least this is a decent follow-up to Crackdown and Saints knows it doesn't have one of its own. But then, am I even really into Saints Row when a majority of it isn't what I like about it? And while that's the first confusing thing, the identity of the Saints Row series has always been unstable and chaotic. Saints Row 1 is this weird combo of Volition giving up on a free-roaming Punisher game, then looking at Grand Theft Auto and learning that people felt underserved by its side content. They beat GTA to the 360 and did well in its absence, but with a lot of people treating it as little more than the warm-up act while they waited for the real rock star. Then when GTA 4 took to the stage leaning in a more serious direction, this let Volition pull a Saints Row 1-2 punch. Would you rather go bowling? Or steal a septic truck and spray loads of sewage on pedestrians. Further pushing that insane side content and promising to give people what they wanted from Rockstar. And it worked. No longer the warm-up act, Volition was bringing the heat. But that bonkers side content was still packaged with a semi-serious world and story. One which has stuck with me all these years. Me and a friend beat it several times over in co-op, and replaying it for this video has been a blast. Besides solid gameplay, it has some of the best character writing for a crime sandbox of this style. Then the third goes forth. We beat it once, and that was it. It had lost us. I recently read an interview with two members of senior staff at the time saying that craziness was more or less always the natural trajectory of the franchise. People loved wacky stuff like insurance fraud, and so they kept leaning into it. The serious elements were taken as holding things back, and so making the world and story equally absurd was considered cohesion. Neither of these two worked on the first Saints Row, so I'm taking that writing of history with a grain of salt, but it was strangely melancholy to learn that this game, which really resonated with teenage me and still kinda does, was internally considered a stepping stone on the way to something I really dislike. I got got harder than gat. It's the immediate issue with fan feedback. Of course people love the standout crazy stuff. It stood out. All a marketing mind will ever take from that is to make everything the crazy stuff. Not realizing or even caring that it flattens the entire experience. And that's because nuance will always be the last resort of salesmen. A quote from said interview. We had long discussions in development over whether the Ronin should have swords on their back or not, thinking that players would care about that stuff. But they didn't. And I was kind of left thinking, sure, maybe, but you still should. Speaking as a vaguely pretentious games or art guy, even about an intentionally daft 2008 crime sandbox, the littlest details are the biggest sign somebody cared. Discarding that care because no one will notice is really telling to me. I'll admit, I never thought much about the swords on a sod spine, but I did notice how empty the third felt. Also, didn't one of the gangs have swords? And well, sword or no sword, the third was also the series finally carving out not just a niche, but its own identity. This is the first entry which didn't have to build itself up in contrast to GTA, but to do that, it killed its own built-in contrast. Saints Row became the crazy one, unapologetically, without holding back, all the time and 24-7. And I really didn't like it. There is an irony that the moral conflict of the third is selling out and losing your soul, and to be incredibly melodramatic, that's what it felt like to teenage me. I think for all my love of two, the third taught me more about what I like and dislike. Non-stop over the top is tedious and headache inducing. Pole vaulters can only go over the top because they start on the ground. I hate do cool things buttons because I prefer to engineer my own, rare, cool moments. I hate vapid pop culture references, semi-ironic celebrity worship, and smug above it all dialogue. So that just happened. Oh yeah! This is happening! So if you want to know why I'm such a killjoy, you now know exactly who to blame. Me. Then there's four. I don't have an unhealthy distaste for it like the last one, but I was checked out. I'd long since found another crime series which hit that mix of stupid and seriousness I seem to adore. Bit more wordy though. Besides what I read in those interviews, all of those feelings are around a decade old. Saints Row was a series that had two entries I liked. I'm only jokingly bitter about the third nowadays, and I may crack a joke at you if you tell me you like it, but there's no malice in that joke, just banter. And I couldn't even remember that Johnny wasn't actually dead, but that's because my interest sure was. So when that bloody trailer came out, I had one reaction. Eh. 
I like some of the action shots, and I like the idea of the leads being underdogs who take on bigger gangs not through unstoppable murder but surprise and daring do. If the heart of Saints Row is escalation, resetting to a lower power scale makes a good amount of sense, since that's more room to grow once again. But that's as much as I like, and that was all me seeing things in it. What I actually saw, I liked a lot less. <laughs> While I just defended the idea of the characters, in practice they all came over like they're pandering to a demographic which only exists when a boardroom is off their tits. Their banter and designs were off-putting and ultimately, I didn't want to spend time with these people. So while I'm not screaming woke like an alarmist clock, I'm also not sold. As a Saints Row fan, I understand the letdown, but as a Saints Row 2 fan, I well and truly understand the letdown. We haven't spoken in a while, but I know his number by- I'm sorry. Oh wait, they uh, removed that feature. Marketing did ultimately work on me for the wrong reasons, which doesn't matter to marketing, but hey. Interviews and previews came out promising something that is in scale and tone between Saints Row 2 and 3, which was transparently people at Volition covering their fan bases. but okay, you got me curious. And from there, it gets even more intriguing. Different interviews from different staff are all saying different things about the new one's inception. Some said it's not Saints Row 5, but early on they settled on a mantra of 2 plus 3 equals 5. A soon-to-be-important principal designer says it's all good aspects of previous entries, then relentlessly insists the game is more grounded multiple times per answer while only ever seeming to know what happened in 4. You put all this together and now we're on Saints Row 11, and things aren't adding up. Glassdoor Reviews of Volition says it suffers from too many cooks in the kitchen creatively and clearly they can't take the heat. But funnily enough, this inability to decide what their story is wound up being the most honest preview of the game I could find. And so I picked it up with a morbid curiosity which wound up beyond satisfied. As a player, this is not a game I would recommend. It plays like a shovelware free roamer from 2012 that we stopped talking about in 2013, but that's only the shallow reading. As a games criticism guy, I love it. If you dig beyond the surface level flaws, you're hit with a barrage of contradictory, unnecessary ideas, all threaded through a story which is disgustingly confident in its own charm while being excessively masturbatory, mealy-mouthed, and tone-deaf. As charming as used Cushell. As of right now, I can't say whether it's trying to recapture the spirit of Old Saints Row, but I hope we'll figure it out as we go. And as cruel as it is to say, I kind of love pulling this apart. New Saints are supposed to be canonized after all, though this may just wind up a beatdown. Let's get this shit started. Saints Row the New One has three back-to-back -back openings, and none of them leave a good impression. Were this game a dancer, it would achieve the impressive feat of having three left ones. Worst foot forward, otherwise firmly in mouth. The first opening is the least offensive and least necessary. It's a flash forward. A businessman pulls up to the Saints Church mid-party, clearly intimidated. He steals his nerves and says he wants to side with the Saints. We see establishing shots of major and minor characters, random partygoers, and off-the-wall gags. The camera and staging treating all of these elements with equal importance, which blurs which shots matter and which are just fluff. And all the while, Antonio is led up to the boss. Who we get a pretty clumsy body shot of prior to customization. And despite being dressed to depress, she goes and opens a wardrobe so we can customize our body. The boss and Antonio clearly have history, so the boss plays up their newfound power, then goes to make an address not just to their loyal saints, but a challenge to every gang in the city. The feed starts glitching, and in an actually pretty cool cut, we go from a video of our revelry to being dumped into an open grave, moments with the friends flashing before our eyes. This intro is the least bad, but also fails to earn its place. In immediate terms, it fails to set up three quarters of the core cast. Kev is shown DJing, so you know, bit of a hint at what he's about. But Eli's picking up a drink, and Nina is just walking. I had to make my guy a multiple amputee just so these two stood out. Give them shots which communicate a little of who they are. Show Nina impressing saints outside with a modified car. Have Eli doing a little business seminar. Get rid of this stupid fucking cat! If I hadn't seen the marketing materials, I would have never guessed these two were important parts of the story before they just so happened to be up on stage with us. So this intro isn't strong to begin with, and as you progress further into the story it starts to feel more and more superfluous. A narrative device used purely for style without substance. The intrigue of what's gonna happen to the saints feels cheap as there's no actual foreshadowing in the opening itself. There's no re-watching this and feeling like the context has been enhanced, quite the opposite. The story also doesn't build towards this party, giving it a sense of foreboding. When the party was suddenly a thing that was going to happen, it felt quasi-random. Not a bombshell, but a dud. 
I do also find it tacky we see the marketing boss prior to customization, and this could have easily been avoided. Just focus the camera on the closed wardrobe, then cut in. Done. As for character customization, I'm not really the right one to judge since I'm not actually into this stuff, so I'll say it's okay. The menus are clunky to navigate, but there's freedom enough. Plenty of people said it doesn't quite hold up to the old ones. Sure. In 2, I always played a schlubby British geezer who always looked a bit of a thumb, so my standards aren't really high. The menu in much of this game has western motifs, and I think by following that I lucked into the best voice. A modern cowboy starting up a posse. <laughs> On this voice alone, I was occasionally endeared to the boss, as this time around they're often annoyingly smarmy, and this voice had a naive and earnest quality which went some way to balancing it out. The other male voices are just kinda snotty. Who messes with the saints? No one! I said, who messes with the saints? No one! It's not the car, it's a silly naughty boy! I also designed him to look like someone who might have been a bouncer at some point, but because I'm bad at it, he looks more like a giant muscular baby with a mohawk. Overall, this intro is as shallow as the grave we're dropped into, but it's going to be the next one which piles on the dirt. We cut to a few months earlier, a few months earlier, an orientation video for private defense contractor Marshall. It's all very Starship Troopers slash Robocop, a comparison which somehow surprised the game's principal designer since it's not just on the nose, it's downright in there and yet this guy says it's not. It does the phone thing again, only without the cool effect or stylistic purpose, which makes me question their authorial intent. This game has a weird habit of trying to do camera tricks, but only when phones are involved. And it turns out the MC is re-watching the orientation, because it's his first day on the job and he's desperate to put in a good performance. So obviously the first thing he does is mouth off to a superior. Well, I mean, we're about to be shot at, so I figured it couldn't hurt to brush up on our healthcare package. If you weren't paying attention to the briefing, I don't think you'll live long enough for your copay to matter. So I should be reviewing the life insurance policy. You know, our job interview has a 5% mortality rate. Statistically, the odds were low that you would die before we hired you, but I allowed myself to be an optimist. Your parents should have treated you better. Yours should have treated you worse. Credit to the game, the dialogue is efficient both because I already hate everyone, and we've already hit the apex of this game's big joke. One of the core conceits of Saints Row the New One is, what if gang, but business. Could have called this suited and rebooted. What that amounts to is that sometimes during a shootout, characters will throw out surface level gig economy or corporate speak. It's shallow juxtaposition and nothing more. Life is cheap and murder is lucrative. Let's get paid! This entire intro is that one joke over and over again. We annoy Gwen and talk about how much we want our bonus while committing mass murder. I didn't laugh the first time, and the next 15 minutes did not turn me around on it. Gotta earn that performance bonus. The problem with what if gang but business is simple. And uh, I said, look, I'm a businessman, and my business is crime. Organized crime is literally financially motivated. What if gang but business is not a joke, it just is. There are actual jokes to be made, but besides taking more wit than this game can muster, it may also be more clever than it's allowed to be. Be your own boss isn't really a new twist on crime, it's just putting it in wankier terms. It's been that way since banditry. I actually have to give props to Saints Row the Third, since while still underserved, what if gang but celebrity is a good base to work from. It's interesting satire, reflects something people really do, makes celebrities out of criminals, but it's not flatly parodying something by just stating aloud what it really is. It's an actual angle to play, and it is played, in story and in game. Back to the present, I hate the subtitle calling my character, you. Don't yeet my chain, game. This is no laughing matter! I know. We're here to bust some guy called the Nawale. We raid his western themed compound as martial men die in droves. We go above and beyond. Literally. And it's thanks to our initiative that that trifling Nawali is brought into custody. Despite all of this, our superior, Gwen, is not pleased with our performance and stiffs us on our much needed bonus. Here's what the intro is trying to do. We're meant to be the young, motivated upstart whose brilliance goes unrewarded by our stuffy superiors. Gwen is meant to be that superior, and we're to relate to the frustration of succeeding in our own way but being unappreciated for it. To put it nicely, the game kind of botches this. Martial men are on the receiving end of a massacre, and framed against this slaughter, Gwen comes across not as a hard-ass unfairly keeping us down but a professional trying to keep her troops alive against the odds. 
This makes the MC's antics come across not as charming, but childish, ill-timed, and petulant. Got her down! Shit! Whoa, take the turret! I got it! I'm good with these. No, that's not- You are damn lucky we don't have time to argue. See? Told you I was good with these! Just shut up and shoot! I'm left immediately despising him. Meanwhile, the PMC flunky looks unbelievably forgiving. Newbie, once we hit the saloon, you flank left while the rest of us hold the center. Flank? But I can- Yes, ma'am. See? I'm flanking left as ordered. She's got the patience of, um, a saint. Honestly, Gwen's only mistake in this situation is not firing us. And by that I mean shooting us in the back and writing it off as a misfire. This is going to be a consistent issue throughout the journey ahead, and it's why I know this intro is meant to have us coming across as a lovable goof, rather than a lamentable git. This game has an uncomfortable reverence for its leads. Despite their constant dick-headed moves, the framing always contrives to have them as in the right in fashions that are transparent and dishonest. It feels like they overthought how earlier Saints wrote its characters. Why did I do that? Back then, the leads would often do terrible things without hesitation. So, why did people like them? Well, there was no trick to it. The fact they were bastards was so obvious that it's never dwelled on. This allowed the writing to be snappy and the characters to be personable. It turns out people liked them because they were likeable. It really is that simple. Saints Row The New One wants that same juxtaposition of likeable people doing horrible things, but it overcompensates. It insists upon its protagonists, making out their violent antics as charming eccentricity and the world is at fault when it fails to appreciate them. All this does is make the writing hypocritical. It breeds resistance and at its worst, as in right now, downright contempt. And I know, the people dying here are part of the bad guy PMC. We're primed to find their lives disposable and death slapstick. The game tells you early on, it's cool, don't worry about these mooks, you're just here for your paycheck. I mean, okay, but what if they're doing that too? Why is it cool for them to meet their ends, but for us it's just making ends meet? We'll come back to that at brunch. Pompous as it is, if I were writing this game and had to include this intro and didn't have the entire senior staff rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, including mine, I'd cut the in-media res and start us here as a faceless, voiceless mook. We tried to follow Gwen's orders, but the situation forces us to be separated. We don't disobey her, but are put in a position where we have to act independently and wind up winning the day through our own initiative and cunning. Despite this, Gwen criticizes us for circumstances beyond our control, denies our bonus, and if we really wanted to drive it home, she takes credit for the Nawali's capture that should rightfully be ours. And boom, we've established that no matter how hard you try, if you work for the man, you are going to be used and tossed aside. This is when the boss decides not to be a pawn. We do character customization, followed by them tossing away their helmet, pissed at a system that will do nothing but take, ready to speak and stand up for themselves. Hell. Could even be a nice little Saints Row, the first one, callback. If one of the messages of this game is going to be that the man won't respect you, maybe the opening shouldn't be a really good reason as to why. At least this way, I wouldn't immediately hate the boss. That'd come moments later. We get credits as the boss makes their way home in a beat-up truck. This finally lets me say something nice about the game. The drive into the city is incredibly well done. Santo Aleso looks really distinctive and the skyline is dotted with interesting landmarks, which the route chosen does an almost masterful job presenting to the player, first as a whole, before shifting and turning to present them more individually, building anticipation towards the open world. There is, however, someone neutering my praise. Goat balls. Really testes my patience? Goddamn cow balls and tizzle stick between them. Makes me question who the fuck scrote this. Big, giant, sweaty, dangling horse testy just swinging in the goddamn breeze, knocking back and forth like a pair of motherfucking clappers in a giant horse flesh crotch bell. It's a gag that would only come over well if basically any part of the boss did, but after his one man screwball comedy, I really, really want him to sit quiet for five minutes and let me enjoy the drive. One developer described this as the funniest part of the game. I'd say nuts to them, but they'd die of laughter. At home, we get our introduction to the friends. These new saints gave everyone something to row about. The idols are trying to build a post-capitalist society where money is not a concept. Are you gonna help me get the waffle maker or not? As an investor, I don't like wasting money. I don't have to love it, I have to pay my student loans. Phew, <laughs> I'm in. My god, so much exposition, I might die of exposure. So, in decreasing order of actually having a personality, 
Nina is a struggling artist working for the Panteros, a car-themed street gang. She's working with them until she can break into the art world full-time. She is friendly. Eli is a wannabe entrepreneur. He is ambitious and snarky, yet friendly. Kevin Bakes has a waffle tattoo, DJs, doesn't wear a shirt, sleeps around, works for the Idols, a hypocrisy-themed street gang, and is friendly. He's not so much a character as he is verbs. The issue is, much like the gangs but business bit, they're not going to develop beyond this starting point. Matter of fact, they'll do the opposite, but hey, at least that's motion. This is also the first time the game really has to depend on sitcom-style call-and-response joke-telling, and it understands the structure but not how to do it gracefully. Every joke is painfully telegraphed and predictable, yet paced so slowly as if the audience would need time to catch the setups. We just knock off a payday loan place. No one gives a shit if people rob those bastards. You have a job now. You could actually just take the loan. Eli, I don't do business with morally bankrupt companies. You work for Marshall. It is further dragged down by the aforementioned fact this scene is trying to bring you up to speed on what everyone's deal is and show what good friends they are. The tragedy of it all is that it's trying to do so much yet it has so little to show for it, and that would be true even were the comedy well crafted. What sort of waffle maker can I get for 35 bucks? Uh, presumably one that makes fucking waffles? <laughs> <laughs> The boss does have the best lines, but then he's brought cocaine to a sawdust sniffing contest. Not that these softies would ever touch the hard stuff. You look like you could use a mugmosa. Thanks, Eli. Ugh. I mean, I'll give you a volition. It's a fitting drink for these mugs. Their relatability is a sham, their dialogue painful, and while I can't work OJ into this bit, would love to see him get hit by Agent Orange. Point is, their friendship feels forced. Perhaps they should have started as just roommates and we see the relationship develop. Starting with an established friendship is trickier, denies a potential avenue for growth, and has been done terribly here. But all of this does bring me to one of the most fascinating game articles I've ever read. One guy that got interviewed here and there was principal designer Damian Allen. I want to preface, I have nothing against this man personally, but I do not like how he interviews. He treats questions less as questions and more as opportunities to pivot things into marketing copy and vague promises. His answers are roundabout and often leave me feeling like I know less. Enter interviewer David Jenkins. His article starts with a scathing preview. He tears the new one a new one and heads into the interview with an inquisitive tone. One which catches Damien off guard. He waffles so much Kevin may as well have a tattoo of him. And eventually David just goes for this haymaker. I must say, I do have my concerns about the new characters, as they do not seem very likeable. I don't know what age they're supposed to be, but they look really young and that's quite disturbing when they're talking about murdering people in such an offhand manner. To me, there's a visual and tonal disconnect there, and they all seem very smug. Smug seems like one of the key words I would use to describe the game's tone as a whole. These are not people I would want to hang around with. Jesus Christ. This for me is up there with Peter Molyneux being asked to his face if he's a pathological liar. And Damien is no Molyneux. There is no inertia for him to get any spin going with this. He's stuck. He thinks for a moment and pulls out Johnny, saying, well, he wouldn't exactly hang out with that guy. This backfires as David hits back that younger players might find him aspirational and while I wouldn't go that way, yeah, Gat is likable. He's fun. He's cool. You want to see him in action. This interview is incredible. Better than Frost Nixon. And the weirdest thing is it's in the Metro. That's the shitty paper you get for free on the bus. So Damien has just been told the characters are unlikable, disturbing, and smug. So he says this. We really wanted to allow the player to express themselves through the boss character and the characters around them. Eli, Nina, and Kev. They are our friends and confidants and people that work with them. His response to being told the new characters are reprehensible is that people can express themselves through them. He retreats back to the marketing line and it is the worst one given the circumstances because it points to the biggest problem with Saints Row the new one. It is betting everything on the players loving these characters. It does not have a strong hand. It has been told as such and yet it will not fold. This approach feels like another reason the new one contrives to present its leads as justified no matter what they do. Like it has it in its head that players will relate to them in such a way that it fears slighting this imagined audience by proxy of the characters. This stalls the protagonists from ever being too interesting or defined. To call them characters already feels like a stretch. They're closer to horoscopes. Utter Pisces of shit. Frankly, the biggest insult would be if you could even begin to see yourselves in these monstrosities. I've met people in Gen Z, and bar a small selection of terminally online oddballs, they're just people. 
They don't act like this. This portrayal is an insult to the generation after mine. Oh, wait, hang on. Oh, these are meant to be millennials. It's a millennial power fantasy. It's just an insult to my generation. And hey, it's brunch. So let's go back to the PMC guys, particularly in relation to this scene. You know, sitting around a table with friends talking about the harsh realities and injustices of life. I get that it's a stylistic choice. It's part of the joke of the world. The job is murder, but it pays the bills. You get it? How did Marshall get Things we do for rent. But the juxtaposition is lopsided. Instead of coming across like an organic marrying of absurd world with true-to-life problems, it's a switch that gets flipped when it's decided that life has weight again and the audience must care. It ironically works against the protagonists, making them feel selfish and inhuman. I imagine it's part of why David was put off by young people talking about murder. The premise is wishy-washy and doesn't establish itself. And I promise, we're nearly done with the intro. I know it's taken a while. This game doesn't exactly wait to tell you about its issues. And they need money. We just knock off a payday loan place. And despite some protests, the gaggle, I ain't calling them a gang, head off to the payday loans joint. Ooh, can we take a hybrid? Eli, I love that you're worried about fuel efficiency, but I reckon acceleration is gonna matter more. Your carbon footprint always matters. That's nice, Eli. I'll leave a carbon footprint on your throat. On the ride over, this twerp plays a recording of his favourite motivational speaker, Roger McGillicuddy. You What's the rule? To Don't to the yuck someone's yum. Life throws your way. You have more agency and power than the world wants you to know. This is meant to communicate Eli's hunger to make it. Roger McGillicuddy speaks the music of my soul. The thing is, what bits of the speech you can pick up on are so incredibly cliche that it winds up just making Eli come across as a complete poser. What can I say? The world is full of uninteresting people, and I'm not gonna be one of them. All right then. We've had a lot of awful lines, but good God. Are we listening to Roger McGillicuddy because we forced Eli to drop Jordan Peterson? Eli, mate, you are so goddamn basic, I could code you on an Atari. The robbery goes down and the group splits up. Eli and Kev take the money while Nina and Boss run distraction. The cops come after us, and this makes twice in a row the radio gets stolen from me. They waste a licensed track on this random, easy, early game police chase. While this is a me issue, this coincided with the moment I decided that my character's going to be a metalhead. Yeah, I sometimes pick my radio station based on what I think my character would listen to. I don't know how weird that is, but it's not like I can do it right now. First time we get to drive a car under duress and I can't even listen to the music I want. Some freedom to express myself through the character. Our switch car has been scrapped by some Panteros. I ain't got time for this shit today. So we nick a bike, nearly fall into the hands of the police, and Nina does this. The two drive home, saying this city is full of promise. And well, something better be. My issues with this segment are more sneaky than everything we've gone over so far. Not as outwardly annoying, but no less all-encompassing. And you know how we should celebrate afterwards. Karaoke! Yes! No, not that. Last time we got creative, I got stabbed three times. You got one of those for me? You really want one after last time? I am not the first person to accidentally shoot a friend by dropping a loaded... Yeah, okay, I don't need a gun. If you're lucky, the cops will get to you before my people. The Marshall intro shows us as an over-the-top badass. You really think you have what it takes to bring me in? I mean, yeah. The only thing which can deign to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with us is a criminal so dangerous an entire army has been sent after him, yet we're the difference maker. Now we're robbing a payday loans joint and the story wants to pretend this will be in any way daunting? And for some reason we need these goons to get away with the getaway? We're told in our previous capers we only got away by the skin of our teeth. But then throughout the rest of the game, it keeps telling us the characters were always brilliant, and also Nina just does this. To not so simply summarise, there are vampires that can handle stakes better than this game, since they at least have the heart to go through with it. Again, the characters and the way they're handled is the problem. It leaves the dialogue vacuous and events unexciting. They're all meant to be brilliant yet unappreciated, yet it still wants to act like they're at risk of failure because we're also meant to be underdogs finding our feet. 
It wants our victories to feel easy because we're great, yet monumental because we're overcoming the odds. It can't have it both ways, but it keeps trying. This results in repeatedly paying lip service to the idea of danger while never baring its teeth. One line in particular really irks me on rewatching. If you're lucky, the cops will get to you before my people go. That could have been a good moment to show the characters have miscalculated, made a mistake and things have gone awry, genuine tension and a new problem they have to get out of. It might even suggest they're not perfect and have room to grow. Can't have that now, can we? Instead, hiccups in their plans are only ever born from things outside of their control or where circumstances force their hands. The characters only miscalculate twice throughout and these exceptions will somehow be even more confounding. Going back to Saints Row 2 once again to kinda curb stomp this entire intro in terms of character, stakes, and characters making mistakes, my favourite arc is the Brotherhood questline. I love how this entirely avoidable conflict begins and escalates because of the boss. An amazing little thing happens in the first meeting with Mero. His girl makes an off-colour joke which sets things off on the wrong foot and reveals a good amount of character for everyone in the room. This does more in one tiny little moment than the five minutes everyone here spends reading off their fact sheets. The boss is offered a 2080 split, and if you do this plotline first, this comes over as pretty deferential. However, given the boss's arrogance, he balks at the deal and kicks off the conflict as a matter of petty pride. This escalates into an incredibly messy war, with both sides sinking lower and lower in retaliation, the Saints only winning because of the boss's raw brutality. Every arc in Saints Row 1 and 2 have the Saints face genuine resistance, make errors, and take losses, and the Brotherhood has one of the series' most famous examples. It keeps things exciting and makes the victories really land. It's why I love the boss in Saints Row 2. His arrogance, capacity for violence, and willingness to do anything to win works in service of gameplay and story. And the fact is, violence and mayhem is really all he's good at. It's an actual character trait which doesn't always work in his favour, he creates many of his own problems, but lucky for him, he's also an excellent troubleshooter. This makes him dynamic, entertaining, and believable within his setting. He's a terrible human being, but a really fun character. This boss also winds up more relatable as a game protagonist, as his personality and goals cleanly align with the players. Build the saints and have fun. When I'm playing as him, we get along like a house on fire. Probably a fire we started. And that's tragic because compared to the new one, it's so startlingly obvious and effortless a way to have the player connect to the character. He's a perfect conduit for play. Having my ultimate murder badass gripe ineffectually about student loans doesn't build connection. It makes me wonder if the message is I should Kaczynski the SLC. Despite everything, if I was going to start the game anywhere, it would be here. Open on us getting stiffed on our bonus, meaning we have to work our second job to make ends meet. This would give the game a cleaner sense of escalation, make the peril problems less pronounced, and tie into the game's themes less messily. I hate this intro by far the most, but it is also the most necessary. It's just made that bit worse by what's around it. And with that, we are free of the openings. They do a better job introducing the game's problems and its characters, though as you can guess, they're often one and the same. If Saints Row The New One is trying to recapture the spirit of old Saints Row while telling a story that's more nuanced, character-focused, and complex, it's doing bad overcomplicating, misunderstanding, or undermining what worked before while failing to make a good case for the new. Now, I want to say, for all of my reverence of 2, I don't just want 2 again. I can go and play it now. It would be nice if we had a PC patch, but hey. As a series fan, I want to see the qualities I like carried forward, but taken in interesting new directions to keep it at least a little familiar, a little fresh. I am someone who believes you shouldn't just give people what they want, but what they don't know they want. It's risky. I mean, I fell off at the third, so yeah, I know full well. But I can understand why people like it, and it undeniably carries Saints Row's DNA. But this, this is a genetic aberration. Who is this for? Who does this please? Let me get the beginning. No! And let's have one last interview snippet, this time from executive producer Rob Loftus. When asked how he'd respond to those hesitant that the new game isn't gangster enough, what he more or less says is, well, you do criminal acts. It's such a strange dismissal or utter lack of understanding with what the criticism really is. I'm personally not fond of much of the backlash. I think angry people drowned out Sana heads and gave Volition a nice excuse to ignore everything. Not that they helped themselves. But if I was asking that question, I would be frustrated by that answer when there's a million possible good ones. Times have changed. 
we're depicting another aspect of criminality. We didn't want to tread on the toes of the old characters. We really need to use Saints Row, otherwise we are going completely bankrupt. You don't have to kowtow, but as a series which played to gangster culture, maybe explain that that image of a gangster isn't in the zeitgeist anymore. Though I'll say this, for a Saints Row game, especially one claiming to take after two, trying to cushion the characters' mistakes and sand off their rough edges to make them more presentable is a naive endeavour. Much like sandpaper, they only work because they have some grit. Even separated from its larger franchise, it's just a poor story on its own merits and- Christ, I'm just saying that before we've even gotten started. I mean, I'm saying that after having finished the game personally, but the intro alone has dragged this much out of me. I keep hitting things and going, oh god, I have to explain this within the first hour? It's in a way impressive. To be so obnoxious and packed with problems, I think I just went over what would be in most cases an entire narrative's worth of shortcomings before the title card. This game will never be on a greatest of all time list, but it manages to get my goat constantly. Still, all in all, the intro does a good job of accurately priming the player for what's to come. The journey ahead will be awkwardly paced, indecisive, mealy-mouthed, tone-deaf, and try to be everything while failing to be anything, so... Points for honesty. We get a mission from Gwen. The Panteros are moving smuggled antiques and she wants us to track the convoy. Do you want it to look like an accident or a statement? What? Well, I'm assuming you want me to make the convoy disappear. No, I want you to follow it. So I can kill everyone and retrieve the stolen goods. This joke goes on several times longer than it needs to, and results in the boss bitterly sat along some bloke called JR as we trail through a canyon. You know, I heard about you. I'm a little bit of a maverick myself. Two crazy badasses like us, we're not gonna mix it up. We don't engage, just observe and report. Are you gonna just let him shoot at us? And was very clear on not engaging. Jesus, you get reprimanded once and you're like this. A cat with a warhead jammed up its bits would be less of a sourpuss than you. Ultimately, we get dragged into a shootout with the convoy, and I actually have to give the game some... theoretical credit. Starting us out working for Marshall has a few clever bonuses which could have really worked in the game's favour. The fact we have to wear their uniform denies self-expression. It builds anticipation towards being able to dress for missions. It also means we use exclusively martial gear, which does much the same while giving the player early access to decent all-rounder weapons well out of our personal budget. And as we'll definitely have this gear now, the combat can be balanced around it. So how is the combat? Oh god, don't get me started. Oh wait, that's what you're here for. It's a clunky mess of moves which do a better job fighting each other than the enemy, an anti-gestalt combat system, and nowhere near good. For a start, the controls are a best fit for small skirmishes, the amount of health you have and number of enemies you face are about right for a muso, and you have a suite of Mobra-esque abilities. There's no real cohesion or balance between these mechanics and the encounters they need to combat. It's very dodgy, an irony in itself since the dodge is worthless. Aiming is horrendous, far too sensitive and unable to be fixed. Within the first few hours I realised the best course of action was to just tap ADS and shoot repeatedly to score easy headshots. The enemies now having really beefy health bars just makes most weapons not feel all that punchy, and the few that do just contributes my repetitive tap and shoot strategy and repetitive strain injury. I could toggle constant lock on, but I want to feel like I'm contributing anything to what's going on. Speaking of less control, the new one has also removed the ability to pick up enemy weapons. This is why some of that credit is theoretical. Saints Row the new one has a tiny suite of weapons, and since a player can't readapt on the fly, every weapon is either balanced, bland, or busted, with little in between. I'm only speculating that this inability to grab drop gear feels like a casualty of weapon customization and upgrading, and if it were a decision between these two, I'd take the ability to grab gear every time. I know it's not an engine limitation, as pick upable weapons appear in specific instances. Takedown's return, now getting a big obnoxious circle in the middle of the screen, and your health is capped in segments, with Takedown's letting it refill to max. Their importance is inflated from earlier games in a way and rhythm which doesn't suit this one's. It's clearly inspired by Doom, but where that game worked Takedown's into its frenetic pace and chaotic resource management, here it feels out of place, a well-like mechanic cribbed without understanding why it worked, and it contributes more to tonal issues than gameplay. I wouldn't be surprised if at some point during development we were meant to be able to pick between takedown styles. Then they realised they didn't have enough to pad out each moveset and just tossed them all into the same pool. 
I say all of this because it's jarring to go from a goofy Karate Kid riff, to a stylish yet efficient John Wick inspired double tap, to something so gratuitous it would have not important telling you to maybe calm it down a bit. For everyone worried Saints Row lost its edge, nope, there they are. The boss was carrying all of them. <laughs> Some enemies have armor, and this needs to be broken to open them up for a takedown. But then we also have skills, and the very first one you get completely bypasses armor. It's also the only skill that was in any way useful or plain fun to use. It kills the target foe and has what seems to be insta-kill damage within its blast radius. It takes several levels before the player unlocks a bog-standard grenade, and what's more baffling is, why isn't a grenade just a standard weapon? The weapon wheel has a throwable slot. Skills work off of flow, which is generated by damage, so unless I've gone from one scrap to another, I can't open a battle with a grenade. That's the best time for them. Grenades aren't just a way of saying goodbye, they're a hello. They're the aloha of armaments. And for some reason they have pitiful damage. The balance is all kinds of odd. No other skill comes as close to being as overpowered as the one you start with. This costs the same amount of flow to use. And why would you use that compared? It's janky, awkward to line up, and offers nowhere near as much utility. Some of the later skills still appear to be broken, either giving me temporary weapons without ammunition, or not following the behaviour suggested by their preview videos. This is after the big November patch and several months out from release. Enemy gangs also have their own specialist enemies and I'm not a fan of these. The Panteros come out best with melee rushes and turret gunners, which force the player into changing up tactics. Meanwhile the idols and Marshall field far too many elites whose abilities come down to just dragging out a fight longer. No mixing up a strategy, just wait for them to stop delaying. Saints Row the new one technically sports greater complexity and arguably depth than its predecessors, but it has all come at the cost of spontaneity and variety which I would argue is of far greater value to a crime sandbox. The lack of weapon pickups, the takedowns, the skills, the enemy types, rather than expanding the gameplay constrict it, creating repetitive encounters which all play out the same way. Even the word play feels like stretching it. It's why I'm not fond of awesome buttons. I mean sure they look flashy but they actually remove the player from the equation. One last strange control thing which encapsulates all of this. There's a button to auto-shoot explosives in the environment. Now I'm a guy who always forgets to go for explosive barrels so this is basically made for me, but it's another thing which downplays the player. And overall that's what this combat feels like. Like I'm involved as little as possible. Going back to Saints Row 2 again, combat is a ton simpler but that's to its benefit. It's a system where the player is always the agent of mayhem. Everything feels conducive to chaos. Ragdolls getting knocked over by cars, pileups occurring around me. Even the AI feels tailored to add to this mayhem, making every gunfight that bit more exciting. This results in far greater gameplay variety at far less effort, since every block will feel different to fight in. The situation is constantly changing and it's up to me to respond and overcome. This is helped by there being few canned animations. Even the grab and throw move is player directed and I never feel like I'm being left out. Back to the convoy, this mission is a sizable improvement over what came before. Gwen picked us in the hopes we would get spotted, and now that we've done our job as a distraction, she's demanding that we pull back. Oh, this one's burning too! Run to cover! I thought I ordered you to retreat. Honest to God, I am trying. Well, as distractions go, you're exceeding expectations. The boss trying and failing to follow orders is a much less grating dynamic, it's actually sort of amusing. Speaking of, I find it funny how comparisons to Robocop flummoxed a member of the team when Mission 2 is a massive homage to Fury Road and the Uncharted truck sequences. It doesn't quite have the presentation or fluid gameplay to really do either of them justice, but is being carried by a decent premise. As the situation worsens, JR loses his nerve and Gwen hands control of the operation to us. By taking down the convoy we recover something called the Hummingbird Codex. Impressing Atticus Marshall, head of the company. And in turn Antonio Espina, chief curator for the Museum of Santo Eleso, and he requests us as chief of security for the piece's unveiling. But before then, JR gives us a ring. After the scrape in the desert he retires from Marshall and is using his bonus to build a garage. One problem, the idols are giving him hell so if we cut them down, he'll cut us in. Doing this unlocks gym robs, allowing car customization and access to the chop shop activity. There is an immediate problem. Get your hands up! This means there is exactly one mechanic shop on the map. 
There is one place you can get a rim job in Santo Aleso, and it's this absolute hole. You want to stash a car you come across, you had exactly two spots in the game to do it, and they were nestled close together. The November update did add eight more, so hey, that's two per month it took to get the patch, but still an upgrade. Let's talk Chop Shop. This was a contentious and dull activity in the first two games, and the concept has been reworked. Rather than scouting the map hoping certain models of car would spawn, you now work your way through a linear set of objective vehicles. As an aside, Wanted, this game's replacement for Hitman, works much the same way. They're now a series of dreadfully unfunny skits masquerading as mini-missions. Would you like a butterscotch? I always keep some in my purse. No thanks. They're not very interesting, and the most humorous thing about them is how they dry up so fast. These new versions are undeniably less annoying, but it was achieved by stripping out their unique elements and then not figuring out new ones, so I'm not going to give the game too much credit. But for how early Chop Shop comes along, it could have been a really clever bit of pacing. Each target vehicle is different, and several have unique mods which take time, money, or specific vehicle challenges to access. Chop Shop opens well before the player will have much money or have cleared many vehicle challenges, meaning vehicle customization is a luxury and the best stuff isn't unlocked yet. Basically, Chop Shop is positioned to be an amazing preview of the game's breadth of vehicles and what you can do with them, giving a player an itch before they have the scratch. And this could be great. But it backfires horribly, as besides the mods being more of a hindrance than a help, and the monster truck feeling about as impactful as a paperclip, in trying to celebrate the diversity of the vehicles, it instead reveals their greatest weakness. They all feel the same. Cornering is lumbering. Public opinion is likely to turn on this game faster than its fucking vehicles do. I've never before played a game where dirt bikes and muscle cars hit corners exactly the same. And this is to encourage drifting! Which has the opposite problem, being slipperier than the devs' responses to criticism. There's also an issue that the game can't really convey a sense of speed or weight. Even on a straightaway, the fastest car I could get my hands on doesn't come over all that impressive. Even the VTOL feels slow. My overall biggest frustration with driving, however, is in how it favours the player's car. Basically, every vehicle you enter is given an extra helping of mass and is unlikely to take damage in most collisions. One Chop Shop target is a go-kart with kneecappers, which in this game just function as an instant kill, and ironically the only thing they've kneecapped is variety. I can understand all of this from a certain perspective. If this is going to be a game of player expression, flattening the differences between rides so that everything is broadly useful means a player can pick whatever they want and still be viable. You want your tiny piece of shit car to be just as destructive as a tank? Hey, no problem. I find that dull, however. Part of learning a vehicle's ins and outs and where they excel is part of that expression to me. I love my Ethel in Saints Row 2. It handles like shit and isn't that fast, but it's a goddamn fortress on wheels and that's cart and castle of why I keep it. Meanwhile, sometimes I'll break out something more fast or nimble and I'll have to use it differently. It makes me like all of my vehicles in different ways, and because my car isn't arbitrarily favoured, it means I have to really make use of its actual strengths and account for its weaknesses. And there ought to be a few outright shitty vehicles in the roster. It's exciting to get backed into a corner and have nothing good to work with. And this brings me to chases. Car chases in open world games are basically unlimited variety. The matchup between however many cars and how you have to drive them, the streets you go down and the turns you take, a series of decisions and gambits to outwit, outmaneuver, and outskill your opponent. A car chase is a story in motion, and this game has just one script. Sideswiping. Were this just a move in your arsenal you could pull out as you wanted to knock away encroaching coppers, I'd let sleeping dogs lie. The problem is, chases aren't so much built around as shackled to it. Every few moments, one to two pursuers will pull up alongside you, and it is more or less an invisible QTE to swap them away, or else you get swiped and take a ton of damage. And I can't overstate how scripted this is. Pursuers gain infinite mass and will match any speed to ensure this goes down. And on top of this, we have rubber banding and sneaky teleportation to keep the cops in contention. There is nothing more frustrating than perfectly swiping an enemy into a wall where they should definitely be out of the chase, only for the game to respawn them right on my tail. It's infuriating. And that's the chases in a nutshell. They're inorganic, dull, and fail to even begin to understand why a chase might be interesting in the first place.
I realised during editing I wasn't being as methodical as I should have been. I got into maybe one police chase outside of missions, where obviously the game will keep a chase going until I clear my objectives. How about when it's not policing the police? Well, a car chase in the open world is like grinding in a Tony Hawk game. I had to regularly slow down to let them catch up, and then if I went flat out, in this bloody Mr. Bean car, the game was still dependent on regularly teleporting the cops to keep them going. This is pathetic. But hey, if you're not on a mission, there's a way to instantly escape any chase. Which isn't hard to begin with, but maybe someone needs the help. Despite the presence of watercraft, it appears the police have no boats and thus will not pursue you into water. Seems a bit of an oversight, but thanks to that, I'll give the chases a C-. Activities are now called side hustles, because of the joke. We're introduced to the first three after the intro, then the remaining two one mission later. I find that really funny. Like, they wanted to stagger these out but had no idea how, and it's just like, oh yeah, we forgot these. And I can't really blame them for it. Atcher is the most basic. There are various businesses using gangs to coerce positive reviews, so we have to make a racket to kill the racket. It's a riff on Yelp. I'll at least commend the gag for being sort of imaginative with the star rating also being your difficulty select, but it really is just combat, and even the hardest one-star raids really aren't hard whatsoever, so there's really no reason not to pick them. Pony Express surprised me. It's the best part of the game and decently enjoyable. An A to B time delivery, typically set in the desert surrounding the city. A lot of my issues with driving remain, but it is really fun to just ramp off hills even if the jump physics are utter nonsense. It at least disrupts the stupid sideswipe script. It's like the desert forces the cops to actually play the game. And that brings me to its clever conceit. Police patrol the quickest routes, meaning a player has a choice between taking a more circuitous but safer path or risking a chase. While held back by the game it's in, Pony Express is at least enjoyable. The environments and extra layer of decision making do get around a lot of the game's deeper flaws. Then we have Wingsuit Saboteur. Um, yeah, this game has a wingsuit. I didn't realise I had it until many hours in, and that's because the game wasn't told either. What do you imagine a wingsuit activity would be? Chasing cars? Taking down priority targets? Maybe a checkpoint race? How about flying from rooftop to rooftop to shoot guys and blow up satellites? over and over again, turning this semi-unique mobility option into a glorified spawn selection. This activity isn't awful, but it is awfully dull and it makes me wonder what the point of it was. Choplifting is the worst activity and basically the only time you'll use aircraft. An update to the earlier game's towing. Diversion. The only thing it successfully pulled over was the tedium. At first everything seems ho-hum, the aircraft controls adequately and the routes do little to challenge. Got the statue! On my way to the rendezvous. And then you actually grab something, and it gets weird. The game doesn't really seem to bother with simulating things like weight or heft or momentum or whatever. Got the package, stand by for delivery. Instead, the moment you grab something, it feels like your acceleration is artificially dampened. Rather than pressing a direction and moving in that direction, the game just starts storing random amounts of energy and then releasing it all at once. Meanwhile, at other times, it feels like you're controlling the helicopter from the bottom up. There's no better way to put it, you kind of have to experience this control set for yourself to understand it. Despite all of that, still an incredibly easy mode thanks to incredibly lenient time limits and very little threat. The only danger is falling asleep at the wheel. That truck seat. And last up we have Riding Shotgun. It's neither the best nor the worst, but I have to end on it because it encapsulates side hustles as a whole. Gameplay wise, they are turret sequences. That's it. They're all little comedy skits as the boss gets annoyed at his client for doing something stupid while we blow things up. What happened? I killed the fucking dealer and stole his stash! Seriously? We were just gonna pick up some stuff. Oh shit, they're coming after us! We're so dead! I'll deal with them, you drive. This constant barrage of dialogue and focus on skits is the first all-encapsulating thing. Every activity is filled to bursting with dialogue. I'm gonna be honest, the activities feel tailored less to be focused on providing gameplay and more for their ability to have the boss talk to his bosses. Every delivery is a skit about the package. Wingsuit has an arc with the boss trying to guess why he's doing this to an annoyed agent. Every riding shotgun is your escort's life story. They also feature context dialogue and even every Atcher has bespoke jokes. And I'm curious if this need for every mission to have a unique context and voice acting is why there's so little content overall. And if that's the case, it is such a skewed set of priorities. 
Here's the odder thing. Compared to the story, this dialogue is a big step up. All oh, that money is long gone. I got bad habits and expensive pay. Or is it the other way around? From basement level to ground floor, but that's still an improvement. Actually, credit where it's due. Steer clear of the cops. Law's on me now. <laughs> yeah, but not for long. I got a good feeling about you. A character with charisma. Especially funny that he's in the one good activity present. If it's too hot for the mail, man, I got you. And we do instant delivery, guarantee. Instant delivery? None of this overnight, same day bullshit. Instant, right fucking now. Now don't forget, instant delivery. Guarantee? That's what I like about you. You drive fast, you learn fast. He's a diamond in the rough, in a diamond in the rough. And honestly, every once in a while, this game does manage a good line. But they're just infrequent enough that it would take me a good few seconds to register. They'd sneak up on me and moments later I'd stoically realise, huh, that was alright. It was the strangest lack of feeling. This sheer amount of dialogue extends into the story in a different way. As far as I can tell, every mission has unique combat barks and contextual quips to suit the situation. That's what you get for smuggling antiquities. This is the biggest showing of confidence the game has in itself, that I find respectable anyway. And the effort is commendable if not the result. You, you got a place to say your <laughs> it's one of those tragic things where if this were done well and people love the characters, this would be a praiseworthy aspect. But that's not the world we're in nor the game we're playing. The other noteworthy aspect of riding shotgun is this. See, this game adds a wrinkle to a common mechanic. In a car you can only equip small weapons, but the ride acts as armour. On the roof you have all of your kit but are unprotected. And this alone is enough of an innovation that they feel they can build an entire activity around it. And that is such a succinct way to sum up how these activities feel. The game mistakes sitting on the roof for raising it. A tiny tweak to bog standard gameplay is worthy of several side missions. Now, I'm not going to pretend Saints Row 2 didn't have stinkers. I don't like Septic Avenger, Heli Assault, or Fight Club. And a lot of activities are pretty straightforward. Drug trafficking is a standard turret section, but you can switch cars and as it goes on, it becomes a really non-stop fight for survival. Having good core gameplay really does just smooth a lot of these activities over, and you have a lot more of a fill of them. I feel more like I can drop in and drop out when I want a flavour of gameplay, and that reminds me. Here's how long it takes me to go from one stage of an activity to the next in Saints Row 2. Done. Here, when an activity ends, you're dropped back into the open world exactly where the mission ended and you have to hoof it however far to the next one. And yes, this is at its worst in Pony Express. This may be an oversight or a means to stretch out the minuscule amount of content on offer, but hey, at least there's quick travel. I've seen people say the new one features the introduction of quick travel to the series, and it would be a bad one if it was. Quick travel points are few and far between, and aren't spaced out for much map coverage. Yeah, did you know you could quick travel in Saints Row 1 and 2? You just ring up a taxi, the number is on the side. Man, these games are great. While this isn't really an issue unique to the new one, the unlocks feel quasi-random and besides really low monetary and experience payouts, there's very little consistency. The game technically has more rewards than earlier games, but they're all things like wingsuit, weapon, and car skins. Replacement weapon models in place of weapon variety. Very few gameplay modifiers. And there's absolutely no telling when and where you'll get a meaningful unlock. It's like they had a bunch of stuff and no idea where to put it. Beating Chop Shop gives you the ability to summon your favourite car and you think, oh cool, Beating Ventures gives me cool stuff. But it's actually in the minority that does that. Then you just get a ton of boring vehicles dropped on you which clog up the garage. There's few surprises and often disappointments, and clothing is much the same way. The decision to spread clothing out between a ton of shops and stalls rather than a select few chains winds up a little toe curling. It just bogs the process of getting kitted out down. Though the bigger problem is the clothes on selection. There's a ton of what feel like incomplete sets, making it impossible to coordinate a lot of outfits. Also, there's no option for how to wear things like shirts and blazers and you can't pick your fabric. I do think the new one has more clothes overall, but it's far harder to coordinate and personalise. One new convenience feature is the ability to customise anywhere and- <laughs> Damn it. Caught with my pants down. Here's a random gripe. You can't access your map while wingsuiting. And trust me, at this kind of speed, I want to know where I'm going. 
Luckily, thanks to an oversight, you can hit the mission menu and then exit back onto your phone. The game doesn't brick when doing this, so please just let me access my bloody map while in the air. Speaking of the map, quick access to it is bound to holding down tab. That's a mild disorientation, and I got used to it, but what really annoys me is that every time I unlock a skill or a perk, it overrides the map button and does not give me it back until I consent, forcing me to look at the new skill I unlocked, even if it's a fucking passive like a health upgrade. In Saints Row 2, I can be dual wielding within 5 minutes of hitting start. In the new one, I didn't have access to this perk until after I had cleared the final mission. And I was doing every piece of side content which came my way. I was scraping the bottom of the barrel before I could bring both of them. I had no meaningful content left which this ability would have made in any way more enjoyable. The cherry on top is that the perk was bugged, switching on and off at random. Alongside skills, you have perks with slots unlocked and then purchased at various level boundaries. The challenges in this game are not only dull, but they come in entire sets of often arbitrarily grouped tasks, and after you complete a challenge set, you get given a perk. I have no idea if they're in set order or random, but there's a bigger issue. The challenges feel less like an interesting incentive to mix up play, and more a dull checklist. I didn't know until I decided to google if the game even had dual wielding, because in the tens of perks I'd unlocked I'd seen one winner, a perk which refilled nitrous whenever you pulled a near miss. That's really cool, that changes how I play, the others are things like… fire resistance, in a game where rolling instantly puts fire out. I mean I know why it's here, Volition has fire resistance, they haven't made anything good in over a decade. That was petty, what the fuck. The big problem is that perks are unlocked linearly by number of challenge sets completed, and you can only ever see the name of what you're getting next. The system is never spelled out to the player, but it's not long before it feels like the writing is on the wall. These are not worth the effort. Why bother? The game should have instead tied specific perks to relevant challenges and let you see what you would be getting. Perhaps dual wielding should be tied to handgun and SMG headshots, that nitrous perk to racking up near misses, the refill all health when depleted to escaping near death so many times or doing a certain number of takedowns. Since perks exist in free tiers the difficulty of the challenges could relate to those perks and make the stuff at the top feel really hard won and worthwhile. This way a player could pursue perks which suit their playstyle or sound interesting to them. It's better than feeling inconsequential yet being sequential. And this way, maybe I could have dual wielding before I ran out of stuff to use it on. And with that, I think it's about time to get back to the story. While nowhere near as bad as the intro, the arc dealing with the creation of the saints is clumsy, rushed, and hollow. Lucky for us, if there's any way in which this game keeps things fresh, it's in finding new ways to frustrate. The mission at the museum is called the Peter Principle, and hey, I actually know what that means. Meanwhile, the mission has no payout. Can only wonder what that means. It opens in the control room. You, uh, Johnson. The boss awkwardly commands his men before making his way out onto the floor. Atticus introduces us to Myra Starr, one of Marshall's board members. Hello, I too am one of Marshall's board members. Still, the boss makes a good first impression. We're told to get a drink and it's at the table we have a chin wag with Gwen. She warns us not to get too close to Atticus but the boss takes it on the chin and wags her off. Then, a warning from Nina. The Panteros are launching an assault to reclaim the Codex. A gunfight ensues. Then the idols join the fray. We take the riskiest path through the museum to the antique, though our escort is cut short. We wind up having to stop to save Myra Star, and the idols use that time to abscond with the Codex. A furious Atticus throws the book at us. We're fired. As the boss crumples he gets a voicemail from Kev, warning us all too late about the idols. While this mission is an alright set piece with some well choreographed action, it's also a perfect showcase for the many ways this game fumbles setup and payoff, short, mid, and long term. In the short term there's the hover case we escort throughout some of the stage. Move it. Your martial ID triggers the sensor. It'll move on its own as long as you stay close. Got it. Now this could have made for a unique gameplay scenario, forcing us into the open to keep the case moving lest it get overwhelmed, but we can actually leave it completely alone and progress only once we've killed everyone which feels a bit of an oversight. But the real problem is this. Shit! Well, should be fine, it only moves as long as- oh, ah yeah, okay. The game just forgot it said that. Does that sometimes. In the midterm it's this. Gwen warns us not to get close to Atticus, that he only sees results, and the mission ends with us failing him and getting fired. The thing is, this game is filled with setup and payoff, 
Very little of the literal goings on in the narrative are technically unsupported, but the amount of time between these setups and payoffs can be as short as a matter of minutes. It comes off as though the story thinks it can do whatever it wants, so long as it is in any way foreshadowed. So it just never stops talking. You can't take it at its word because it has far too many of them, and even the validity of what pays off is questionable. Gwen warning us not to get close to Atticus doesn't gel with what's going on. He's pulled us up and we're following his orders. This is how the story feels mealy-mouthed. It insists on undercurrents that just aren't flowing. Now for the long term, as per being named the Peter Principle, we're meant to be out of our depth as a leader. But we're gonna found the saints in the next five minutes and our quality as a leader will never be in question. This is another example of how Saints Road the New One just kinda does whatever it wants. Changing characterization is needed to create cheap drama, not even caring if it suggests the opposite of a character within a mission or two. And I know this is pedantic, but... What just happened was not the Peter Principle. Put simply, the Peter Principle says that in a hierarchical system, people will be promoted one step outside their level of competence. But we actually do our job as security chief pretty bloody well. We save a higher up and our men are directed well enough to keep Atticus alive. Granted, we owe that to Gwen. We're only fired because we never predicted that he would pry some stupid book over his board members. The constant abuse and misuse of setup makes the story completely frustrating to follow, and makes it feel a first draft so much of the time. It's stuffed with lines and ideas which don't add up or lead anywhere, and at their worst they mislead. Meanwhile the setups which do pay off only feel like they're shunted in to support whatever harebrained direction the story wants to go at that moment. Lamer still, the way to guess which setups really matter is which ones will have the most meaningless payoffs, as it only ever commits to the path of least resistance, which is poison for excitement. It needs to be gone through and cut into something with focus, that knows what elements to build on and which to scrap to make events flow better and say something. I know that would be less of a redraft and more picking through rubble, but this mission could work. Gwen's warning could be worked into something good, which hints at Atticus's nature far better. Imagine if instead of saying he only sees results, she gives a warning to protect what matters to him. That way you keep the line's cryptic nature while making it cogent to what's going on, showing Gwen's deeper familiarity with Marshall while letting Myra and the museum act as red herrings for this floundering newbie. It's something the boss could easily misinterpret, and it would have a nice ironic pang when it dawns on him come the end of the level. This is the first of those two mistakes the leads are allowed to make in this game, and it wiggles so hard to keep the boss blameless. We should get more detail on the Hummingbird Codex, as a large part of the plot centers on who possesses it, but we don't even really get a hint at its value and it feels out of focus, and while yes, it might be dull, as security for the event we have a fairly clean excuse for the game to drop some exposition on us about it. The fact is, it drives so much of the plot early on that it feels like something is missing. Why do people want it? If it's just a matter of pride then sure, but give me enough to know even that little. There could even be a cute gag in here, Nina's an artistic type, and she could be annoyed at the gangs and even us for treating this priceless relic like it's a game of capture the flag, but that would take the world having texture and characters having drive which, well, irony of ironies, even the driver of the group lacks. It feels so odd that this mission hints for all of one room that the boss might make for a bad boss. This could have planted the seeds that he doesn't know what it means to command yet, and forming the saints will be a learning experience. But as we've gone over, character growth might contradict the idea that we're great, and well, story doesn't seem to want that. Why would this be here if it not only doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but doesn't seem to matter the moment we step through the door? And now Atticus is hoping it doesn't hit our ass on the way out. You know, maybe this joke would work better if most of the unlocks weren't half as redundant as we are. Hey, it's Kev. I, uh, I made your breakfast if you want some. Alright, everyone's mocked this moment. It deserves it. Kev and Eli invite us along to an idol's party, which, well, doesn't that seem a bit of a slap in the face? They head off and we eventually stumble into the living room where Nina is similarly downbeat. Everyone in the Panteros is pissed and she gripes about how the new boss, Sergio, has ruined what the gang was about. We used to be about family. Now it's all about him. Despite the fact we're not meant to have money for rent, the boss engages in a little bit of retail therapy and buys a ton of knives. Nina doesn't care, and I don't have a cutting remark either. 
Eventually, Nina checks the Pantero's group chat and learns they're launching an assault on the party Kev and Eli are attending, and so we rush over to save them. Oh, Nina! She's turned on us! No! Los Panteros turned on me! We shoot our way in, saving Kev and a wounded Eli, just as a member of the Collective, the Idol's leadership, turns up. Los Panteros should have left the party crashing to the experts! Hang on, wait. Were you just about to shoot up one of your own parties? They're about to execute Nina, but the boss and Kev rush to her defense. No, 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 no! They're cool, they're with me. If they're with you, then you get to kill them. Right, hop to it, Kev. Idle hands are the devil's playthings. Ah, you missed. Oh, he meant to do that. We kill a member of the Collective and flee, with everyone now freed up to join the Saints. Everything about the housemates being in different gangs feels really underutilized and weak. You may have been wondering, how have we been killing members of Nina and Kev's gangs by the hundreds while staying on good terms with them? I mean, for the roommate code, I'm gonna have to fold her laundry for two weeks, but beyond that, I'm golden. It's a repeated weak joke which feels more like a brush-off than a real bit. Maybe the Saints could have started with just the boss and Eli, and as events unfold, Nina and Kevin make their way over. The themes of the new one are meant to be crime and friendship, according to one interview, and Saints knows how little that's worth. Have Nina try and fail to fix problems in the Panteros before her and a few disillusioned others defect from Sergio, feeling the Saints offer a brotherhood that a selfish Sergio sidelined. Her yelling, no, you betrayed me, and opening fire on what sounds like someone genuinely upset at her betrayal, doesn't do much good for her image. Especially since she has been feeding us info. She already had metaphorical blood on her hands. This was just the next step. Am I meant to believe she ever felt the gang was about family when- the Roommate code, I'm gonna- Again, this world, these characters, and their tone is terribly managed and just flips conveniently. And you can have Kevin come to see flaws with the idols, which we'll get into and then follow suit. And again, can't have any of this. Sorry, my natural instincts are that characters should do stuff and be interesting. Silly me. Why have the roommates being in different crews be such a big element of the story early on if there's going to be no interesting hook to it? This plot is like a bloody coffee shop AU for a property that doesn't exist. All the drama filtered out because they don't have the beans for it. And I'm left bitter because I don't think its setup is inherently bad. Roommates in different gangs is juicy. It could be fun with different characters and writing priorities. But in a rush to form the Saints, it ignores the potential it has to hand. That's not to say there won't be blowback. Just that it will be bad in its own way. We cram the wounded Eli into a car and blast our way back home. To calm him down, they put on one of his tapes. And while patching him up at home, we get a confusing scene. Oh, what are we gonna do? Finish sewing you up? Yeah, and then what? The Idols and Panteros aren't exactly our number one fans right now. Isn't that obvious? We're starting a criminal empire. What? Your car was right, Eli. This might be the only part in the game that made me laugh, at least in post when I put together what happened, because in the moment, I was just confused. With every gang in the city after them, they've got no choice but to go into business for themselves. I mean, sure, but where'd this come from? Here. You have more agency and power than the world wants to be. Ah, stayed home with really? mine. The boss has been galvanized by McGillicuddy's words. Eli has finally broken through to him. One problem? I could not hear one word of McGillicuddy because this section gives me a rocket launcher with infinite ammo. Turn it up! The driving force for forming the Saints knocked flat because it was drowned out by meaningless explosions. That's so perfect. That is so apt for this game. Maybe more scenes should just give me explosives. After all, I can't knock the dialogue if I can't hear it. Ordnance beats nonsense. So they hold a meeting, and first thing on the agenda is securing a home base. They all have their needs and wind up taking a church because it's cheap. And yeah, sure feels that way. It's condemned so it's cheap, and it's got a fucking graveyard so we can stash the bodies. Charming. Wait, wouldn't stashing the bodies on our property be really stupid? Oh wait, sorry, it's foreshadowing. Wait, that's still really stupid. We learn the church is due to be torn down, so we wrestle the deed from the real estate king of Santo Eleso. Kevin foreshadows the mission getting padded out. Ooh, I'm gonna post about it. Yada yada da, yada da da da. Hashtag take me to church, hashtag new digs on this, hashtag list. 
and then after killing a few more idols, we witness the bloody birth of the third-rate saints. The saints. We call ourselves the saints. The iconography of Old Saints Row is really well handled. The game never dwells on it while the saints dwell within it. The gang working out of an abandoned church is meant to prime the player to believe they're community focused. It also gives a very clear idea how they adopted the name and their logo. It's the church on 3rd Street. They're the 3rd Street Saints. Where is this church? Up on 3rd. Shut up for a moment. It has symbolic resonance, but also feels like a naturalistic decision. The rundown state of the church explains why it was abandoned, while also giving a hint they're not quite as saintly as they seem. The fleur-de-lis is also great. As a religious symbol, it makes sense it would be in a church, and in a religious context can denote purity, representing how the saints were formed at first with good intentions. At least ones Julius lies about having, which paved the boss's path to hell and back. As a symbol of royalty, it represents divine right to rule, which comes to pass as the saints take over more and more of Stillwater. Bonus points for Julius Little being former friends with Benjamin King, of the Vice Kings. The symbolism gets corrupted as soon as you put together what Julius is actually doing, but the second game is outright with it. The home base is no longer a church, but the grounds beneath it. No longer even pretending to be protectors, the saints are reformed as nothing more than another power-hungry street gang. But the fleur-de-lis still works as it was also a symbol the French would use to mark criminals condemned to exile. There's a lot of imagery in Saints Row, but none of it feels forced. If you want to get wanky about it like I just did, you can. But you don't need to to understand a well-told story with elements of power corrupting and good intentions faked, exploited, and gone awry. It's easy to believe that the Saints just so happen to work out of a church and fly this flag, but on a deeper textual level it's giving the player insight into the world's intent. This game has nowhere near as much meaning to sink your teeth into, but the symbolism still sort of works. But it now feels completely hollow. They got a church out of convenience and a name the Saints because this is a reboot. And how they get the fleur de lis feels so empty in the context of the characters. Nina's an artist, why not have her come up with it? You'd think she'd at least want to design her own logo. Maybe Nina can mock up a few and the player could choose. It could even be a cute joke about how they're all Fleur themed and she brushes it off as inspiration. Eli's a business guy. Apparently. Have him do bits about branding and market testing. Kevin can... do catering for the event, I don't know. Them discovering the logo and deciding, yeah, we'll just use that. It shows such a profound lack of imagination from the characters and the writers. So yeah. Clumsy, rushed, and hollow. But hey, we formed the Third Street Saints and we're a third of the way through the story, so at least that lines up. You might think things would pick up from here, but the immediate missions following this are stealing a burger toy for Kevin, Eli wanting to learn how to shoot. Oh, are you planning on shooting anyone? After that party, I think I'll stick to metaphorical blood on my hands. I was hoping you could teach me to shoot. Target Whoa! rigid. More trucks coming, let's take them. What am I doing? Yeah, let's flatten his character from an American pancake to an English one. Then Kev gives us a tutorial for collectibles. It takes any possible excitement from forming the saints and runs it right into a wall. So while the pace is broken, let's talk collectibles, and with that, Santo Eleso. Santo Eleso was the one and only good first impression, and I'm happy to say that I really like this city. It manages to pull off that wonderful trick of feeling bigger than it is, and it achieves this through varied zones, filled with densely packed and distinct architecture. Owing to its memorability, it very quickly clicked how to get around, helped by the wonderful use of those landmarks. And while the driving itself is incredibly boring, the city does at least make different areas feel different to navigate, from the more mazy, claustrophobic old town to the wider but grittier downtown. The most fun I had in the new one was driving through the desert listening to country radio, which yes, did become my guy's station of choice. I think this place was my favourite. The game captures an atmosphere I haven't really seen anywhere else, when a sandstorm blows through in the evening with distant lights flashing through the thick dust, the sound of a few people having a laugh in a back garden nearby. There's some character snuck in here that's absolutely nowhere else. It's fair to call this game ugly, as in most situations it definitely is, but it feels like the lighting is rigged to just be really good in very specific scenarios. I really can't complain about the map, but I do think it feels a little too lifeless. NPCs aren't that numerous nor interesting, and they don't muck in in the way they did before. The traffic is similarly barren. Adding to this, there is nothing to do outside of missions and activities. No car surfing, robbing shops, taking hostages, streaking. All the daft diversions that let you inject life into the city at the press of a button are gone. Not even these giant piles of unattended drugs can do it. And I guess that brings me to collectibles. These get you 500 a pop, and are not worth the effort. 
and they're so tacky in their placement. Saying this makes me feel a bit of a snob, but sometimes this game just has the feeling of something you would grab for 5 quid on Steam and it's just a free roamer made out of clashing assets. No sense of care as to where things go or if they look right together. Oh hey, dumpster diving and lost wheels are pretty much the same thing. They're a seemingly random shot at getting a car part. If you get a full set you unlock a new car, and I don't need to explain why I'm not exactly excited by that prospect. Still, I tried for over an hour and luck was not on my side. Every time I felt like I was closing in on a complete set, I would start getting new parts of different sets. Meanwhile dumpsters just started spitting out money as if I was being bribed to stop bothering, so I took the hint. In Saints Row 2, crib customization, while not expansive, did let you meaningfully change up a few houses. The new one has just the church, and customization has been limited to placing objects on plinths. To get these objects you must go out and photograph them. I couldn't be asked. One thing which did bother me however was this. Your camera doesn't actually take screenshots, it's purely mechanical, used for collecting quick travel locations and these collectibles. I just want to request that once I gather the collectible, take away this stupid pop-up telling me about it. Every scenic point in the game is undercut by this big condescending pop-up. Speaking of pointing and shooting, there are ranges. No time limit, just hunting for hidden, bland targets in a big area. No momentum, no score beating, just spend ages looking for that last bastard target to unlock a replacement weapon model. Wanna know the weirdest collectible? And this is absurd not just by Saints Row's standards, but a genuine contender for weirdest collectible of all time. The Collective. The heads of a major enemy faction are of so little consequence that instead of being part of the story, are spread far and wide throughout the game's side content, popping up and getting popped with basically no fanfare. Oh, dark. There's one last collectible, and I'm equal parts bored and floored by it. Welcome to Fort Cullen. To learn more about the history of Santo Eleso before 1854, visit Captain Valera's Rancho Providencia. Listen to every panel at both sites to win a prize. Dotted around historic sites and other noteworthy buildings are hidden histories. You have to find five information kiosks scattered around the local area to learn about Santo Eleso for a prize. I have no idea what the intent is here. I don't know if this is a gag about dull town histories, or the tedium is at the player's expense and we're meant to laugh along, or if they had a genuine investment in the setting and invented a diegetic means to lore dump about it. It's so po-faced and dull and boring and I'm getting paid to hear about it. This collectible is inscrutable to me. While I don't care about the hidden histories themselves, I wonder if they're the reason the city does feel historic and interesting. In that case, I like the result of this collectible, but not the collectible itself, though this is a whole chicken and egg situation. I do have an aside, and it is a little selfish and very petty. The new one has a sort of street art bent. The menus and loading screens occasionally follow the aesthetic. Nina herself is big into art and has a couple of missions about it, and there's even hidden histories focused purely on street art installations. In the UK they even ran a big advertising campaign to find out which was the most entrepreneurial city in England. Leeds won and that makes sense, it takes money to leave. So they hired a local street artist and had him slop commercial garbage over a big wall. So the game has invested quite a bit in art being part of its identity. Despite this, it doesn't really add much to the overall style or tone. It feels lost to the side, lost in the other random artistic inspirations like westerns and 80s movie riffs. I can't even say it's a blend because they don't really mix at all. The art stuff almost comes over like a non sequitur. Too self-serious to be parodic, too lifeless to be enthusiastic. Welcome to the Grand Prix by Lewis Welch Mullane. It's not a real person. Now, no disrespect to these two rappers I'm way too old to know about, but how about instead of, or alongside these two, you get some actual street artists or just artists to make some stuff to put in the game? That would be commendable and would demonstrate real investment and credibility. All of this is assuming this isn't taking the piss out of street art, but I'm just gonna let the fact I can't work that one out speak for itself. It's at this point I'm going to start compressing the story, both for my own sake and because really this is where a beat by beat breakdown breaks down. 
I'm also going to start presenting events out of order in a futile bid to create some. Missions at this point may advance a faction plot, or they may be bizarro one-off skits with little relevance to anything. So warning, I may wind up making this game sound way more comprehensible than it actually is. And I am skipping a lot of really weak character beats which confuse making a skin suit for fleshing them out. Oh no, Nina now has money for art, but art collectors are vapid arseholes. Oh, the idol stole those knives we ordered. We've been put on the wanted app and have to kill our way off. Just go ahead and waste 15 minutes of my time to make a really weak joke about terms of service. In Saints Row 1 and 2, after the opening, each faction would have a linear, self-contained story. Outside of the Sandy arc, the missions rarely feel like filler. They all progress the relevant conflict in one way or another, weaving creative missions and character beats into what's going on, rather than diverting for obnoxious, detractive, full-length character sketches. And as long as you had respect, you could progress any of them at any time. The respect system has been removed, as little in this game is worthy of it. Now missions come in blocks, with progression beyond that block gated to a final mission, which requires building all of the currently available ventures. I'll get into those in a bit. Missions are also no longer tied to factions, but to characters, typically one of the core trio. What makes this downright pointless is that the story doesn't acknowledge the growth of our empire. The ventures and story are codependent for progression, but have no actual bearing on one another, feeling completely arbitrary. This system of missions occurring in sets with definitive endpoints could have benefits, like advancing all of the gang arcs in tandem, freeing up characters to move across arcs, and telling a more singularly focused but deeper story. One shortcoming of earlier Saints Row games was how certain characters would be contained to one arc, and enemy factions barely interacted. Can't have Mr. Sunshine appear in the Ronin arc since there's no way to tell if the player hadn't already defeated him. It leaves interesting dynamics on the table. So, probably not a surprise when I point out, New game's not going to benefit from any of this. They've even made the simple act of starting a mission worse. In Grand Theft Auto, or Saints Row, there are blips on the map. You go to them and it kicks off a mission. Simple, elegant, slots in perfectly between rounds of insurance fraud and spraying the city in liquid shit. Now you open your phone, go to the mission app, get a tiny bit of chatter to build up inane intrigue, and then the blip is plonked on the map. It could be right next to you, it could be Timbuk fucking too. And now since the mission has technically started, no quick travel. This isn't just an unnecessary extra step, it's one in knee-deep wet mud. It's so frustrating because it's such a needless, thoughtless change, burdening a mechanic that was working fine. What's more aggravating is that the side hustles still use the old system, so the functionality is still perfectly in place. Perhaps they playtested and learned that if they put the mugs mugs on the map, no one would ever progress the story. Let's start with Nina and the Panteros. Sergio takes her desertion personally, and steals her car as revenge. In the course of getting it back, the boss is told that wrecking a Pantero's car is a worse punishment than death. And that's not bad world building. That lends some depth to the gang. There's even a solid moment where we interrogate a Pantero's member by defiling his ride. Man, what a great use of a mechanic. Okay, okay, I'll talk. Sergio took your car to the quarry. What? Hey you, if you're talking out your ass, we're gonna take you to Jim Robs to give you a rim job, capiche? Cleverer still, after the interrogation, you're then expected to drive his car for the next objective. It's a really inventive little sequence. Honestly, this game's highlight. We make it just in time to see Sergio trash Nina's car. As he retreats, Nina tells us the car belonged to her mother. And in her dying days, Nina was the only one allowed to drive her around, further deepening the connection to that car we've seen in a couple of cutscenes. It even lends a little weight to her risking it to save our lives in that really dumb moment. Nina swears revenge on Sergio. While it feels a little ramshackle and hollow because all the ingredients which allowed it to work were introduced within this mission, this is the one decent emotional bit in the game, so I'm going to give it that. Anyway, next mission we go to an assault helicopter tourism venue, steal an assault helicopter, and blow up the relatively undefended forge, aka the heart of the Panteros operation. Because it's the Los Panteros barbecue day and they're out and I feel like I'm having a stroke. Did we just go from a mum dying of cancer to playing Mad Libs? She wrecks Sergio's car and... that's where it ends. That was two missions, with a total runtime of 32 minutes, including going to the mission markers. They're the car guys to such an extent that even their story was a hit and run. Is Sergio nothing now because we wrecked his car? Will the gang depose him for failing to defend their greatest asset? Who knows? Who cares? 
I hope you're not sick of me pointing out how the old games were better yet. Don't blame me. Blame them for being better. In 1 and 2, the antagonists of each arc would take up much of the screen time, fleshing out their characters and lending context to their actions. We get an insight into the gang's inner workings, what drives them, what are their shortcomings, what relationships are at play, how are they responding to the saints' actions. And I find it off-putting and really transparent in how this new entry tries to look so much friendlier and more caring and empathetic, but just comes over as entirely two-faced and self-centered. The enemy crews are all cartoon villains devoid of nuance. The saints are always poised to hold a moral high ground against them. And we get little idea of who these people are. It's funny how the older games, despite being so much more vulgar and mean-spirited, did so much more to humanize its antagonists and explore their motivations. It avoids feeling fake and avoids feeling hypocritical by just portraying every character honestly. It doesn't condescend to the player, which that's what this new game often feels like. It feels condescending. It feels like gang war for kids and you are the heroes. The saints aren't heroes, not in the first two games anyway. It's another reason why I don't like how underutilized your gaggle mates are in being former members of these crews. Did they have no friends in the old gangs? Okay, stupid question, who would be friends with these twats? But do they at least not have anyone they don't want us to shoot? If they stuck around longer before joining the Saints, that is the perfect angle to advance this old method of storytelling, where the gangs are explored. Having a friend in there with loyalties creates a fun complication to play on and could really flesh out others within the gang. This game tries to be sweeter, but really just needs to get checked for diabetes, because it can't stop pissing away its potential. Anyway... That was the best arc in the game, and it was only half of one. It gets worse from here. It's as we get into Kevin, I start questioning whether him being so shallow is an active choice, and it's all to do with the idols. As once Kevin joins the Saints, he's even verbier. Any hint of character is gone. Kevin's arc with his old crew is spread incredibly thin over the course of the latter two thirds. After forming the Saints, we run into trouble getting Kevin a childhood toy he wanted, with the idols trying to steal a shipment. We reject Toys. Much later on, he's kidnapped by another member of the Collective. We once again do a little interrogation, this time wrecking the idol camp, before learning Kevin has been strapped to the Santo Aleso sign which they're about to blow up. We rescue him before wingsuiting down to a party being held by and for the higher-ups. The idols disappear from the plot for a while, and then we just go and nick back the Hummingbird Codex from an idol yacht to prove the saints are better. And that's where it ends, they don't do anything. Bloody bone idol, more like. I haven't watched every Saints Row 2022 review out there. I've seen a lot of shallow rundowns, people rage baiting, or just cashing in on the new hateness. It should be clear, I'm not fond of this game at this point, but watching some of these, I found myself defending it because people weren't even putting in the effort. This was just material to them. Your character is working for some special force that is meant to protect people or some shit, and you're after some other guy. I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I really wasn't paying attention. And what's hilarious to me is I feel this vitriol thrown at Saints Row The New One may have ironically shielded it from deeper scrutiny. Why fact check when you want to fact check? No one's going to come along and stand for this game because yeah, it really is that bad. But how do you go bowling with the rails down and still get a gutter ball? I'll still own you because I have more lawyers than you have bullets. I'm pretty sure the amount of bullets in the USA vastly outnumber its population, let alone the population of lawyers. Mate. Have you heard of the term hyperbole? Did you read it wrong and think it's what comes after the fucking Super Bowl? But even in videos I respect, that actually had things to say and didn't just feel like shit pieces, I feel people only scratch the surface, and on that I can't blame them. This game buries problems under problems, and you don't need to go terribly deep to explain why it is bad. But I hope I've shown that if you dig, it only gets more and more fascinating. Case in point, I often found people only lightly touching on the idols, and by and large being left confused by them. That's not their fault. In the midst of this game's many problems, the idols kind of fly under the radar. But that's what pings it for me. On the LED mask of it, the idols are an anarchist gang who want to destroy capitalism and claim to stick up for the little guy. But everything they say is worthless because they're annoying about it. The general criticism of the idols is that, much like the other gangs, they appear, get a big intro, and then do nothing. And that's all you really need to say to make the point that they're badly handled. But what's interesting to me is that nothing in the game is handled like the idols. And by that I mean, hands off. If you pay attention to the incidental objectives and visual storytelling, they become the most complex group in the game, and it is utterly bizarre and it's not to the game's benefit. 
Despite their claims of sticking up for the little guy, they rob Jim Rob. When confronted, they brush him off as part of the system. It turns out members treat their moral code as selective. It's a weak justification to do whatever they want and pretend it's for a greater cause. On top of this, the poor members and initiates all live in poverty and rob locals blind. Meanwhile, the leaders wear fancy suits, have stupid techno masks, and party in a big mansion. How do post capitalists afford a house this big? You put all these pieces together, and Saints Row is basically calling anyone who takes a stand against money a moron or a charlatan. They're either naive idealists, thugs looking for an excuse to commit crime, or con men lying about their beliefs for personal gain. I'm starting to find it funny anyone called this game woke. This all sounds pretty base to me. Now I am taking Glee in bastardry, but in a game where nothing is left to the imagination and everything is spelled out, how is this the one thing which is in any way subtle? The story of Saints Row the New One is a celebration of going into business for yourself. A gang of anarchists opposed to the concept of money, or at least pretending to be. That's an interesting and appropriate foe. Why is it then that everything about Marshall is laid out, everything about the Panteros is explained, but it keeps very quiet on the idols? Was it decided this might be a little too politically charged? And to bring this back to Kevin and how he is uniquely half-baked, he is framed as believing in the idol's ideals early on. His whole shirtless shtick is an idol motif, at least for the poorer members. But the moment he's in the Saints and making money, he shuts up. But he also doesn't suit up. And the game isn't going to draw attention to this. It can't exactly call Kevin a sellout while it's trying so hard to sell him on you. But that's how he came off to me. Maybe not intentionally. After all, every character isn't Nina doesn't get an arc, they get fucking loop-de-loops. But in the end, Kevin looks like a hypocrite, only opposed to opulence until he stood to gain. I've told you before, the idols are trying to build a post-capitalist society where money is not a concept. The money fight! <laughs> I know this would have been contentious and probably made people like him even less. But hey, like your sales figures, go for broke, right? Whoa, 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 whoa! <laughs> Maybe Kevin should have actually made some input on running the Saints a certain way. Try for something like the idols pretended to be about. Have Kevin put his newfound money where his mouth is. Now, you don't have to break out the Karl Marx, but giving Kevin just a hint that he actually believes in anything would be capital. And on that note, in all honesty, before anyone gets too excited either way, I don't think this game really believes in anything beyond what it thinks would make it sell. People who haven't played Saints Row the New One have confidently claimed it's all shallow jabs at capitalism, but I'll tell you this. It can't throw a left or a right. The enemy of this game is at best, bad bosses. They're making a millennial power fantasy which I and others mistook for Gen Z, but that's because this game doesn't stand for, nor understand anything. To commit to the bit with the idols would threaten that objective. The idols are far too fleshed out and the visual storytelling is far too developed for what happened to feel like an accident. I know I'm suddenly ascribing a ton of intent to a game that has so far been unable to tell its ass from its elbow, but this has wound up startlingly near the knuckle. Regardless, the impression I get is it's a gag they chickened out on rather than a serious attempt at commentary. And it only stands out because it's the one thing which feels actively downplayed, and is somehow still one of the most scathing things it manages not to say. The series hasn't gone political. If anything, it's now less so. It's time for some vulgar abuse of power! <laughs> Two was taking the piss out of cops, media sensationalism, news media, corporate monopolies, gentrification, and so on. And it did all of this while being fun and funny. It had a brash, uncompromising sense of humour, and I was laughing at it more on my recent replay than I was as a teen. Jokes are numerous, snappy, and eclectic. New Saints Row talks about balls. Old Saints Row had a pair. Okay, so Nina took the Panteros and Kevin the Idols. That leaves Eli Marshall, surely. It makes sense. He wants to be a businessman. They're a business. Perhaps he engages in corporate warfare against them. Upstaging grizzled business vets with fresh ideas and... No? Okay, what about Blank? Maybe he goes up against Blank, and we have to gain ground in Santo Aleso against... Wait, that's the venture mechanic. Alright then. I got it. Other business owners. Struggling to be seen as legit. No? Okay. What does Eli do? Well... Early on in the game, I was out wandering the desert. I wound up flying over this large scrap metal fortress, which really captured my imagination. We had that Mad Max-style mission. Maybe there are bandits wandering the waste that we'll come into conflict with. That seems exciting. Well, the answer was so much worse. The dust moot event is upon us, and I need to join a house if I want to see the best action. In what was for me the longest unbroken mission chain, clocking in at a whopping three missions and 87 minutes, we join Eli to conquer the Dust Moot, an annual city-wide LARPing event. 
It opens with him inviting us to grind so we can get enough experience to join one of the major houses. The boss politely plays along until he learns Gwen is a major player. Heart is like the only thing that gives her life meaning. I've got money on her winning the whole event. So, really ruffle her feathers if we won. We, what, win it? Yeah, that would get to her. Maybe it's not too late to change my bet. Well, then I'm 100% in. Great. So I suppose Eli is going up against Marshall? Just in the most inconsequential and lame way possible. They then decide to do the plot the game should be doing by having us form our own house and go to war with the others. The effort on display for what feels like a joke made at the game's own expense is absurd. Besides the usual combat barks, it has unique weapons, vehicle assets, and takedowns. A lot of work has gone into this and... to what end? Despite all the pompousness and circumstance, I still feel absolutely no genuine passion for or against LARPing. Hey Eli, what's this 299 stuff? Tis but a microtransaction. That's not a LARPing joke. That doesn't even work as juxtaposition. Scratch that. It doesn't work, period. Like street art, it's just something else that's here. It serves no purpose. It adds no depth to the world. It doesn't feel sincere. Yet it is the most in-depth and mechanically focused mission chain. And I'm baffled. Because Professor Layton is less puzzling than this. The combat was already bad, now you have to do it with a smaller arsenal of incredibly clunky weapons while all of the skills which expedited combat are disabled. Saints Row is now a bad game, LARPing is a worse one. This is also, somehow, the only story arc which directly interacts with the venture system which feels a bit of a piss take, as you have to build Castle Kraken and complete its venture goals, which consist of driving out into the desert to engage in even more of these dumbed down disputes. I propose an alliance. Join our siege of Fort Thunderpump, and we shall crush the Dust King between us. Yeah, sorry Gwen, no can do. What? Who the fuck is this? Come on, it hasn't been that long, has it? You! God damn it! Fuck with my job all you want, but stay out of my game! This is so worth it. Oh yeah, let's just bully the one character who isn't an arsehole. As the antagonist of this section, she is played up as the hard-ass the intro failed to establish, yelling at us to leave her precious game alone while we run roughshod over the competition. What a coincidence that the one prop I don't have a problem with, the game does. As what this really boils down to is a 90 minute mandatory filler arc where we take revenge on someone who helped us. To defeat the Dust King, we need to construct the Balrod. I'll actually give the game some credit. I like the gag that it's just a car with a big mattress strapped to it so we can run people down. That did get a smile out of me. What I don't like is being forced to use it for an extended combat sequence when its turning is just as wide as... your mum. The arc concludes with us launching an assault on the Dust King's fortress. Just as he cheats to deny Gwen entry, we roll up in the bowel rod and force our way in. My and battle is lost, but the war! Ah! So, why isn't this place called Fort Duststorm? All the other forts use the house name. They have corporate sponsors. Why don't we do that? We be not sellout bitches, DJ Kaviticus. Oh, wow. Kevin's playing someone who isn't a sellout. That's gotta be new to him. As we breach the inner sanctum, Gwen cheats and uses the back entrance then further cheats in combat. I can thrash thee all day. I hit you, you're dead. No you didn't. Yes I did. Fucking prove it. But after shooting her a bunch more, she finally breaks. Enough! This ain't you, Gwen. What happened to the anal retentive, by the book, ass kicking buzzkill that I kind of respect a little, sometimes. God damn it, you're right. How did I fall this far? Oh, you make me so crazy! Dang, I didn't mean to break you. If the crown means that much to you, take it. Don't fucking patronize me. You won this time. I'll take that crown off you next year. They deserve that. And that's how it ends. I mean, we have an overly long bit about claiming the crown, which really sucks, but... What did this add to Gwen? To anyone present? She's a hard ass, so we bully her, but then she gets cheated, decides to cheat in turn, and we judge her for not being a hard ass, and she realizes she has failed to be a hard ass. How do you character assassinate that which isn't a character? And more importantly, why was this Eli's plot? 
for what little they're worth to begin with, everyone in this game is wasted, and not in that fun Shaundy way. Nina's meant to be a great driver and mechanic, but we do all the driving and go to Jim Rob's to have our cars done. Eli's meant to be this driven entrepreneur, but we do all the legwork, building the ventures and handling the cash flow. Kevin's meant to be the guy with connections, but bar a handful of side hustle and venture characters, it's just as likely for Nina, Eli, or even the boss to know who to talk to. Hey, I mentioned Shaundi. See, it's a setup like Saints Row does. She also has Kevin's shtick of sleeping around. In Kevin's case, it comes down to characters sharing completely banal anecdotes of past flings. So, Teddy. She was cool. She still is. I was thinking maybe next time we do a karaoke night, I'll invite her. Unless she's back with Melissa, of course. Ugh, Melissa. I don't find this charming or cutesy, just awkwardly indulgent. The game insisting on Kevin's quirkiness and storied past, and it does this constantly. It never forgets to remind you who and what these characters do off screen. Kevin knows so many people. <laughs> Reagan, all he has to do is buy him coffee to get him to sign on. Did you guys know Kevin is charming? Somehow eluded me. With Shaundi, this aspect of her character actually matters. Her exes come into play regularly. Some relationships ended amicably, others not. You could argue it makes some dodgy jokes about her, but she's never knocked by it and can banter just as well as anyone. She clearly enjoys who she is, and it is far from her entire character. She's also funny, clever, dependable, lighthearted but also motivated, and actually contributes to the group. She has a personality which isn't just shallowly alluded to, but one which pushes events forward and drives her to action. And it comes across so much more effortlessly. I don't think any of the new characters have a single quirk that it knows how to put into play beyond the realm of acknowledging itself. They're not only unlikable as characters, but useless as functions. One general thing about each of the leads is they are recent additions to Santo Aleso, which, beyond making their thoroughly insisted upon friendship even more incongruous, is that it's the kind of setup which is a good excuse for them to learn the ins and outs of the city alongside the player. And oftentimes, yes, the player is brought in on the knowledge, but time and again it will be said with a presumed importance that the player is meant to buy in on. Not a total deal breaker, but again, it's not quite sure what to do with these characters. They're not superbly written, but they're written in a fucking superposition. It's such a convoluted mess. They're new to the city, but they know everything. They recently became roommates, but they're best friends and have a deep history they keep alluding to. They all worked in the gangs, but have no meaningful connections to them. They're all talented in different ways, but you do everything. Some stories get lost in the weeds. This is nothing but. It's weeds all the way down. Why was the marketing and Twitter feed so ride or die for these formless blobs? Because the game itself has chosen die. This leaves us with one final thing to sort out before Endgame. It is what I naively assumed and even hoped the game would be about. The trials and tribulations of forming the Saints. First, we need to find recruits. Eli has a plan, but the boss thinks it sounds boring, and instead goes to a livestream murder island to kill his way to the top. And the calls start coming in. They want to learn from the master! We're sensational! I'm not sure why I'm able to be let down, but after it felt like the story was in a rush to form the saints, I was hopeful it would slow down and we'd actually see some of the process. Feel our millennial powers form before our eyes. But okay, we build our crew off the back of people who spend all day watching a livestream murder island. Wouldn't be my first pick for people to hang around with? For one thing, I'm a bit worried they might eat Eli. Isn't the fact that Bizarro Murder Island feels completely out of place a hint that the tone might not have been set right? It's not cartoonish enough to sell it. Yet everything also feels so inconsequential and dull that it's easy to mentally brush it aside. Which is handy, because this is the first and last time we're going to hear about the Murder Island. It's a contrivance, albeit a high effort one. In the Bizarro Piss Stream of Consciousness style Saints Row has gone for, this is also the one and only time it mentions streaming. Is this a joke about streaming? Because I've streamed a bunch and it's not quite like this, despite what my VR streams would tell you. Is this a bit? Is this a gag? I wasn't a fan of Professor Genki, but the third made it work. So, how do we meet our recruits? They want to learn from the master, so are we going to train them up? Kick the other gangs from the local area? Of course not. That would make sense and establish rapport. The very first time we see any of our saints in action is from Nina telling us they pulled an armored truck robbery off screen so we get to go and collect our cut. I feel like we may have skipped a few steps along the way. The mission is we go there, take money, and then do a rail shooter segment. Breaking news. Police chief 
Chief Michaels is coming to us live outside the Santo Ileso police station. I'll make this quick. The Santo Ileso PD has identified a new menace plaguing the streets of our city, known as... Holy shit, that's us! The Purple Shirt Mafia. What? That's not our name! As of today, they are public enemy number one, which is why I'm creating a special task force to bring these criminals to heel. Task force? Holy shit, we really have hit the big time. Uh, you do realize this is gonna be a huge problem, right? Ah, they can't even get our name right. How much trouble can they be? This results in a singular mission played after the credits, where we destroy the task force. I guess the boss had it right. Anyway, the very mission after the crew robs an armored car, we're treated to the stupidest scene thus far. I'm talking about what we're paying the crew. You mean what we're not paying the crew? Saints Rut Row? Besides last mission was literally showing the crew making money, this is at a point in the game where we have several ventures open. The boss is on three million a week. I think that can go some way to paying them. Why shackle ventures to the narrative if money ain't flowing with the story? People joke that characters in Yakuza don't understand crime, but these mugs seem to think you put a gang together for the purpose of paying them. Guys, the millennial power fantasy is not me paying people. That's the millennial reality. All right, so what? We rob a bank? We rob a train. Turns out a Marshall train moves bank money into town every once in a while and Nina says we can hit that, but then has a realization. Oh my God, I'm so stupid. The forge, that's what they were gearing up for. Nina. We blew up the forge two missions ago. But to be fair, this line is pretty ambiguous, and it sounds like the prep may have already been done, but I have no idea. Feels far too deft for this daft game. I'd add a line saying that since the forge is gone, this train robbery is now do or die for the Panteros, adding some stakes into the story and... Sorry, hang on. Dracula's at the door. Despite just forming the saints and seeing they're ready to rob, despite being unfailingly confident he can handle anything solo, Despite being the one to put him away, the boss says he needs one man. Let's get some extra muscle. A top tier murder machine to help me out. You want to break out the Nawali, don't you? This is already pretty ropey. So I'm actually going to take a page from the game's book and disregard continuity to talk about the next time the Saints matter. The train robbery's a success and the Saints are gearing up for a party. Sorry folks, party's over. Who the fuck are you? Chet Drummond, Marshal General Counsel. The Saints are now a wholly owned subsidiary of Marshall Defense Industries. Due to some screwy employment contracts, Atticus is able to sweep the Saints out from under us. We're now Marshall property. I don't know if it's a sign that I am way too optimistic, but this mission reignited some hope in me that something interesting could happen. This Marshall buyout is, at long last, a clever play on the core conceit. Something gangs as a business can uniquely do. The boss gathers up the saints and without just claws, launches an assault on Marshall. This is the one time you fight alongside the saints in the entire story. They are that much of an afterthought. More like Ain'ts Row. But what I liked was the feeling there was some actual intrigue and the leads were butting heads. The boss is pissed and Eli is trying to talk him down, pleading that this isn't a battle that can be won through violence. And I like the boss for being angry to the point of ignoring him. Murder can't solve everything. You shut your mouth. That line had some surprising venom in it. I'm surprised the boss was allowed to be that mean to Eli because that was emotion. I even think Nina and Kev had done well in this bit. Kevin's all gung-ho about going to war and Nina's just going along with the boss's whims while Eli pleads with all of them to understand that they're in over their heads. It's like for a moment, the personalities actually manifest in these lot having distinct voices and approaches to the world. They still ain't hood, but they've achieved characterhood. While I don't want to break out red face seriousness, while I don't want to break out red face seriousness, this bit is still laden with really, really weak comedy writing trying to take the edge off, but I'm giving this game any credit I can. This is the first time they feel genuine, that Eli is the character the game talks about, and the boss's impulsive murdering isn't played as charming but short-sighted. In a better written story, this would be the birth of an ongoing conflict, as Eli and the boss realize they don't quite see eye to eye and have been building the saints at cross purposes. One problem? We're three missions from credits, and two of those are filler, so get stuffed. I was hoping the boss couldn't solve this problem through violence, not out of spite, but hope. So after rampaging through the building, we come face to face with Myra Starr, who lets us know there's a way to solve the problem with violence. Great. We do so, kill Atticus, and fuss the conflict with martial ends. Killing him was a choice, no idea if it matters, 
but I get the feeling none of this did. I think my hopes were raised, because in this game's inability to decide what it's about, for a single moment it got on my wavelength. I was just a fool to think it might stay there for long, even if it is ostensibly what this product claims to be. We could have had a story which delved into the difficulties of forming this gang, getting recruits, getting their name out, finding business opportunities and how we would get the gang making money. The venture system could have bolstered this narrative, but it outright ignores the gameplay side of the equation while shortcutting all of the interesting difficulties with cartoonish twaddle. Twaddle which the game also fails to commit to. The power fantasy, which is already a bad idea but is an idea, is lost in the complete unreality and unrelatability of the world. I'm imagining a story where after so much hard work, we finally earn our place in Santo Aleso. And it says the gang is starting to feel like they've made something of themselves. Marshall swoops in to take it. Our own aspirations pulled into a corporate monopoly. And then the game explores that corpo hierarchy. We do the assault despite Eli's warnings and this puts us into a deeper hole with Marshall. The saints become a tool for work too dirty for the company to handle personally, but we have to take it to survive. Eli could be pissed at us for falling into this trap. Meanwhile Atticus, seeing the strained friendship, could pretend to take a shine to Eli's entrepreneurial mind and starts acting like a mentor to him in a bid to further separate him from his friends, promising something better at Marshall. Meanwhile, the boss starts working with Myra Starr. We have to be a little more clandestine and clever. And while we're doing all of this, the boss is worried he might actually be ruining Eli's shot at making something of himself, as Eli seems to be buying what Atticus is selling. But the boss has to keep going to win back his freedom from- Why the fuck am I writing fanfiction for something I'm not a fan of? I'm an extractor fan at most. Anyway, this just leaves the Nawali and the finale. Actually, I lied like the game does. We apparently didn't have enough money to fund a gang, despite owning swaths of Santo Aleso. So, let's talk ventures. Over the course of the narrative, we unlock ventures in chunks. Their building costs go up in tandem with their profitability, as they continuously bring in cash. Once you place a venture, five threats will appear in its district. These are repetitive mini-objectives, and clearing each of them will boost its generated income. This takes maybe 10 minutes of effort per zone. The real meat of ventures lie in their activities, with all of them bringing something new to do. This is a solid and thematically appropriate way to handle activities, spacing them out and making me really want to get new ventures to see what gameplay they'll bring. So let's go through them. First, let's separate everything that's an A to B car delivery. That's 6 of 14! We've already gone over chop shop and yeah, a few of these could have done with a chop, but let's break them all down before we move on to anything more unique. Food Truck Kingpin is a Breaking Bad reference. I thought being broken and bad was homage enough. It very quickly becomes clear that where you place your ventures is basically a hidden difficulty select, and makes every delivery repetitive as it is always to that same location. This is basically an A to B delivery, but it has a gunfight at the beginning and the end. And you always drive a truck. This also means you spend more time fighting alongside your army of fast food workers than the saints. A strange quirk of this activity is the AI is way more aggressive here than anywhere else. This mysterious Van Man gang would be endgame material were they allowed in the story. They constantly attack and when destroyed will spawn in from the front, which no one else seems to do, often taking massive bites out of your health with frequent head-on collisions. I had to adopt a new strategy to win, and that strategy was pretending I wasn't in a chase. If I just drove and didn't fight back, the AI had no idea how to respond and just followed me home. Waste disposal has us transport waste to a dumping site. What this means is driving carefully, uh -oh. But should the volatile materials get set off, you have to then drive fast to keep them cool. I think it's a neat idea, as the player has to literally shift gears from driving carefully to flooring it for the biggest payout. Theoretically cool, practically dull as irradiated dishwater. Extraordinarily repetitive. Another thing going against this is that pre-patch, the player had to make a whopping 13 deliveries. The irony of this place being called Bright Future is nothing to do with dumping waste, is that the next hour of the player's life is very bleak. Also, I know that pop-up says 14, but the funniest thing is this. Well, that should just about do it. You found the last truck and we're all full up. The final objective, each and every time, is going to the venture manager and being told, good work, which makes the progress bar really amusing. But it was always a nice surprise to be able to clock off earlier than expected. I actually didn't have to bother too much with this activity as besides the flatbeds marked on the map, they'll just spawn on the road. I quickly realized it was faster to just wait outside the dump. The laundromat is literally just Pony Express but with none of its good properties. Towing is towing. 
which was a diversion before, as in a mini mini game. Yeah, the new one is pilfering the most optional of side content to pad this out. Lastly, Planet Saints is just waste disposal again, sans any of the gimmicks which made it even slightly interesting. And that's the note I ended on. This is a crime sandbox. A GTA clone, as they used to be called. Driving is expected to be a big part of play, but there are a few interesting spins on the driving, and it being tedious to begin with does little to help. So much of this game is boring, repetitive deliveries. Next, let's talk returning activities. Insurance fraud is back. It is likely the reason we're here, after all. It doesn't feel as good as it used to, owing to heavier physics. It's also a ton more locked down. You're deposited near major roadways rather than having to head into an area and figure out the best spots or else use bonus zones as guides. Max Adrenaline now makes cars explode, and I have a gripe with this. It seems more chaotic on the surface, but a blown up car actually detracts from chaos as it removes an element from play. I only saw one interesting thing happen in traffic in my entire playtime. Funny pileups and the like are much more common in Saints Row 2, in part because insanity can build up and cascade, and that's because cars will explode after a reasonable amount of damage. This explosion effect also makes the new insurance fraud far too easy to cheese by just launch padding off of parked cars. Once you clear this mode, you actually get the ability to trigger an instance of insurance fraud whenever and wherever you want, and that's a worthy unlock, so I'll give it that. Mayhem is mayhem. With the controls feeling more locked down and a propensity for everything to explode all the time anyway, this activity feels more like a funfair attraction than... mayhem. And half the missions putting you in stiff combat vehicles does little to help and doesn't overcome the underlying problem. This game is too chaotic and explosion heavy to begin with and so mayhem loses its character. On to the new stuff. Eureka Beta stands out in that you get a new unlock for every objective cleared. Which is why it clocks in at the shortest activity with just three. It's all about testing stolen martial prototypes. When I got a hoverboard, I thought, oh cool. That sentence got halved to, oh, when I started moving. If any of the designers' claims of being grounded are true, it's that this is the most realistic hoverboard in gaming. Slow, clunky, everything you don't want a hoverboard to be. The only thing that keeps it aloft is the shame the earth would feel to touch it. We get weird exploding jetpack footballs. I think I'd have preferred a grenade. And then we get this. Got them all. The quantum aperture lets you see enemies through walls, shoot enemies through walls, and boost the damage of any projectile fired through it. Kills made through this thing still generate flow, meaning it also recharges itself. Neuro, eat your heart out. Unlike Saints Row, you actually have one. After this point, the game is more or less broken, as you can just delete every single encounter that lies ahead. Cutting Edge adds another collectible, as we have to hunt the world for unique textures to add custom materials for clothing. I preferred the older system of being able to pick fabrics, and these wacky, often incredibly ugly designs feel like a downgrade. Cact Radio is a strange beast. No, it does not add a new radio station to the game. That would have been cool, after all. We're instead going to tamper with enemy communications. There's an odd twist to notoriety which I'm not fond of. You work your way up the classic stars system, and this culminates in a boss fight. Winning this boss fight clears all notoriety instantly, which I find unrewarding. Now clearing a full notoriety bar while Cact is active adds the gang's respective radio towers to the map, and by wingsuit bouncing off of these towers, by far and away the hardest thing the game challenges me with, we restrict the enemy faction's ability to call for reinforcements. And no, this was not needed. Chases were incredibly easy to escape, and were made even more so after the November patch. After the rebalance, I could consistently escape notoriety by standing still. Chases are so busted that it is on the player to chase the chase to keep it going. I have to do this to max out the venture. I am strong-armed into further breaking already broken systems to make the most money. Hey, maybe this is a critique of capitalism after all. First Strike Dojo comprises of melee gauntlets in order to establish protection rackets. It's a big Karate Kid riff, and it is not the best around. The melee in this game is severely undercooked, feeling slippery and lacking impact, and with absolutely no soft aiming between you and enemies, it's a frustrating struggle not to win, but to even engage with the mechanics. It also lasts an absolute age thanks to tanky enemies and overly long, unfunny gags you are forced to waddle through for every stage of every encounter. 
last and definitely least, people said you couldn't rob stores in Saints Row the new one, and they were absolutely right. Let's pretend has us train up a heist crew because the Saints apparently don't have one. So what role do we play in the robbery? We have to look for security flaws and photograph them. I have no idea how these disparate snaps are enough for a plan, but hey, after taking those photos, we sit outside and drive Git away. This culminates in what must be the worst, most dull, most insulting bank heist in gaming history, as we hear everyone else do all the fun stuff as we sit outside before doing a bog standard chase. And that's the ventures! First we pay for them, and then we pay for them. I'd say they lack drive, but they fucking don't. All but a couple turn into tedious chores before the end. Our saints have not escaped the daily grind. Matter of fact, they're now ponying up for the privilege. But with that, we've conquered... Well, we didn't conquer. We've seen off... Actually, no, that's way too strong a means to put it. We have bored the other gangs into submission. The saints now have their hands in incredibly particular pies all over Santo Eleso. And all that's left is to make it to credits. <laughs> In the mess of absolutely nothing that has happened, everything to do with the Nawali feels like Saints Row abruptly deciding what the conclusion has to be, and working backwards to shunt stuff into place for it to get there as quickly as possible, uncaring how obvious it's being and how out of place everything looks. Oh, don't mind me. It features some of the most effortful set pieces backed up by terrible ham-fisted writing and the theme of friendship being uncomfortably forced into center stage despite consistently being the worst bit player at all other times. A reminder, to pull a train job, we need a jobber. You want to break out the Nawali, don't you? Assuming he hasn't been extrajudicially murdered by now, yes? We sneak into jail and the game does put a twist on stealth and it has a handful of lines I find sort of amusing. Hey, I don't know you. I don't know you either, it's a big company. Stealth focused on looking like you're meant to be there, walking with purpose and so on. Attention guests! A reminder that all constitutional protections are suspended on frontier property, pursuant to Congressional Secret Act number 88. It's not a terrible way to do it. We get caught just as we're freeing the Nawali, and with a little bit of carrot dangling, he'll join us on our breakout. Now, despite two actual cracks at for-profit prisons, prisoners are an enemy in this mission will gun down in droves, which feels a bit hypocritical. I'm bringing this up to be petty, and also because the older games wouldn't create this disconnect, as they never pretended to be more socially aware than they actually were. While the prison scenario is unique, by this point the repetition of the combat completely undercuts its novelty. Older games would definitely let me kill myself by jumping down these stairs, or pull a fun skip if I was able to tank the damage. Come on, you're a sandbox. Let me play. The door's locked. So we kill all the guards in this room. They'll have to open the door to send reinforcements. <laughs> Nuali, mate, if the guards are dead, what exactly are reinforcements going to reinforce? I'm doubting your criminal credentials here, you crap-suited cretin. Despite having just said the daftest shit, the big joke of this mission is the Nuali being unimpressed with our ramshackle and mostly improvised rescue mission. And credit, they get one good joke out of it. Should have stayed home with my... There, we're out of the prison. And how will you get out of the canyon? Uh, to the left? Which is taking us back to the prison. Shit. No. Savor that, it's the last one. We get the Noali out, and despite some awkward banter, and the boss being the reason he was in that jail in the first place, he's down for the robbery. I know what it feels like to be judged for following orders. Well, we don't. The boss tries to learn the tale, and is told, We're not friends. We could be. Foreshadowing both the boss and story digging their own graves. The Nawali makes his way to the church, expecting some heist planning. Instead... Team building. Eli threw out the idea that we should spend a day doing some team building exercises. We have hats! He's clearly made uncomfortable by these goons, and with that, Saints Row has finally managed a relatable character. What comes next is a very belabored and repetitive joke. Well, this vehicle is well stocked with beer, but I don't see any guns. Nope, no guns today. The boss has decided there will be no killing today, so naturally they piss off the Panteros, Marshall, and Idols, the boss growing more and more dejected as his perfect day repeatedly falls to violence as the Nawali lectures him. Why do you seem to hate your job so much? What? I don't hate my job. You are a professional cold-blooded killer like me, no? And yet, 
You do not wish to fight on your off hours. You know, when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Look at your friend, Kevin. Everything he does, he does with gusto. Right, Wally, mate, listen. Unless you're talking about a geezer called Gusto, Kevin does fucking nothing. It ends with them retreating to a secret weapon stash and taking on waves of the three gangs. It's actually a decently chaotic fight. <laughs> Only let down by the UI failing to let you know when an ally has been downed. Come on, Nawali, on your feet. We need you, apparently. This ain't the end. The boss apologizes for a day gone wrong, but in the most blindingly obvious punchline ever, everyone had a blast. They loved it. And the Nawali is now one of the gang. In spite of all my knocking, this is still one of the best constructed bits of the game, with steady escalation, competent use of rule of three, and appropriate callbacks. We haven't done Love Shack since Ghost Pepper Night. Kevin, we do not talk about Ghost Pepper Night. I cannot recall having a more memorable time. Same here. Not since Ghost Pepper Night. Kevin, we do not speak of Ghost Pepper Night. Eh? It's also varied with distinct set pieces and imaginative gunfights as we steal hover bikes and escort the RV, and ending with a pretty good shootout with pick upable weapons, my word. Serviceable in isolation, it is however stunted by what it is in service of. It's trying so hard to sell the friendship, and I am just not buying. It felt like the game was trying to pull a fast one on me. Though my biggest problem with all of this is the boss himself. He has managed just enough character everywhere else for him to feel out of it here. All throughout, barring one very particular instance, a confident, self-assured killing machine with absolute faith in himself and his friendships. You put him next to the Nawali, and he suddenly develops a very bizarre self-doubt. Meanwhile, the train robbery is awful. A boring slog across repetitive square rooms on a looping backdrop. All that's notable is we give the Nawali a knife, get jumped by Sergio, then Nawali repays our kindness. Oh, wow, you just killed him pretty hard. Eh, it was nothing. I know, I just kind of reckon I'd be the one to... You know what? It's good. It's all good. No, it's not. Sergio has been set up over the course of the game. He spied on us before the convoy, was at the museum heist. Nina spoke of him corrupting the Panteros. He wrecked Nina's car and re-responded in turn. He has the best claim to taking the villain's spot. We have hints of pettiness and corrupting friendships, which contrast the boss, making him a good thematic enemy. In a better told narrative, what the Nawali just did would work as a shocking swerve. But that would take either of these characters having any real impact. It would take genuine climaxes to make this anti-climax not feel so fucking soul-draining. This heist may be a success, but I'm the one left feeling robbed. And despite everything, this is all the Nawali does in this mission. He was in no way instrumental to the heist. You useless pillock! Then Nina gives us a ring. Holy shit! Los Panteros are in total confusion now that Sergio's dead. I think we broke their spine. Couldn't have happened to a bigger bunch of assholes. There's hardly any of them on the streets right now. It, it probably won't last, but this is a chance to really take a bite out of their territory. Kick them when they're down, you mean? With steel-toed boots. Call me in if you decide to go for it. And that's the last the Panteros are ever mentioned. That genuinely leads nowhere. Just salt in Sergio's wound. And so the party is thrown. Antonio, who got so much focus in that opening, isn't the culprit. In fact, we don't even see him. The gangs who we repeatedly messed with and then put a challenge out to don't band together and descend upon the saints. The flash forward was totally meaningless. Outside, the friends relish in their victory, having well and truly made it. Completely off our back. The gaggle departs, boss staying behind to soak it all in, and the Nawali returns. He tells us he always viewed friends as a weakness. But after meeting the saints, he wants what we have. I want to know what that feels like. <sighs> well, let's go- oh. <sighs> I said the gag all miscalculate twice. The first mistake was at the museum. The second mistake they made was being too likable. I hate this. <laughs> An entire game doing nothing but talking up these characters, forcing me to spend time with them while they do little but talk in circles about how interesting they are and all the cool stuff they get up to off screen. The way they drag the game away from its marginally interesting attempts at figuring out what its own plot is. After an entire non-adventure of this, the game tells me their one and only flaw, the thing that puts them into danger and makes them count for anything for the first time, 
was that they were too good. I, for the most part, do genuinely enjoy pulling this game apart. It's fun. It can probably teach people how to break down a bad sandbox. But this genuinely makes me angry for the sheer unearned confidence and presumptuousness on display. I hate it in a way where I enjoy hating it, but also just hate it. Where I am baffled by the arrogance that after everything, it thinks it has the right to go out like this. This is why the game had to push the friends so hard. And the player is sent right off the cliff with them. How do you make a scene where you stab this arsehead be unfulfilling? <laughs> This is worsened by what follows, an extended sequence which works to fabricate an emotional narrative out of everything that came before. The boss goes through a dying dream referencing past events, which ironically does more to drive home how little these characters had going on. Waffle iron. Did we ever get that for Kev? We got him a whole bloody kitchen! We're then dumped onto the board game that appeared in one cutscene. When I was playing this, I was lost for a while, not in the game itself, this is genuinely gameplay for babies. I mean, I was lost for, why is this here? Did this board game really have that much significance? Looking back on it, it meant about as much as anything else. Very little. But that's still equal in relation. You spend ten minutes doing simplistic, condescending fetch quests, and you know exactly what's going to happen. It's going to turn into a nightmare board. It lingers for far, far too long before doing the most expected rug pull. From there, we're faced with friends taunting us for past failures. If you'd been there at the idols party, I wouldn't have gotten shot. You lie. You? You couldn't even kill Sergio. The Nawali had to do it for you. Kev? I wasn't calling you. Don't you get it? You're just not a good enough friend. Not even this can pretend Kevin mattered. That's genuinely all you've got for him to say. You were a bad friend. You're a hypocrite. Fuck you. The boss ultimately escapes, urged on by... I'll get to you. He pulls himself out of his grave and wanders through the church. The Nawali has massacred the saints and kidnapped the trio. We cut to a recreation of their introduction. Only now it's intentionally stilted. Everyone's up on a stage and acting awkward around the Nawali. Was meeting the friends at the start intended to feel like a sitcom all along? Why? Why stilt their introduction like that? Why do it for the sake of a terrible callback? The irony is that the first scene feels more artificial. Now that they're up on stage, forced to be shallow caricatures at risk of their lives, it actually feels more natural they'd act like this. The boss kills his way to them, and we get this. You don't get it. They don't need my help. I need theirs. And there it is. The most artificial message in the game. They have done nothing. They are hateful, cynical shells Volition needs so hard to work. And then the fucking cat saves the day. Okay, it may just be me. Actually, I know it isn't just me, but I may be more extreme. I hate this cat. I hate this cat for the same reason I hate the friends, but concentrated. He is of equal worth to them, and that's not a compliment. A background prop to pander and make people go, Oh look, they've got a cat. Aren't they nice? It's empty. I am overly annoyed by this asset. Have Eli be the one to save us. Eli's the one who in this scene is acting like a coward and gets hit for talking before we arrive. This should be his moment after getting shot, saying he wants to stay out of violence, then getting into violence. His moment to really show his mettle and make the point that the Nawali is overcome by real bonds. Then the final confrontation opens with me popping wall hacks and killing everyone in the next room. The final boss is a mess. I mean, he's not very intimidating to begin with, being that we kicked his ass in the intro and had to escort and keep him alive for the last three missions. So yeah, story-wise a bit of a flop, and gameplay-wise, not much better. Three stages, all feeling like the worst excesses of boss design from ten years ago. Seriously, I was sort of nostalgic. First he's a runaway boss, no different from a normal enemy beyond taking a lot of damage before running to the next location. <laughs> Then he gets a helicopter. Ah, uh, do you remember the days when every boss was a helicopter? Hilariously, this is also the second instance of being allowed to swap weapons in case you didn't bring explosives. But funnier still, the fight was not balanced around my fully upgraded RPG-7. And then, how else could it end? But with a quick... time event. 
a petty note, but I find it funny the game will always replace your weapon with a standard Glock during takedowns and cutscenes. Even though I brought a revolver, which would have enhanced this scene, the game wasn't ready for that. Oh. The story ends with a truly sickening moment, moments away from the Nawali's corpse. I'm really sorry, guys. About what? You saved our ass. It was also my idea to get the Nawali's help in the first place. No one could have predicted that much crazy. Bad hires happen. It's okay. No. If anything happened to you guys, I... Hey, we love you. Ugh. I love you guys, too. That's because we're fucking awesome. Stop talking. And guess what? I lied again. We're not done yet. Remember how I said missions and ventures worked in tandem? You needed to place each venture to play certain missions, and you needed to clear those missions to unlock more ventures. Well, I've got one last treat for everyone. The in-game economy is a really mixed bag. I'd actually say it's very well done near the beginning. None of the side hustles, collectibles, or even venture activities pay out all that well. If you want to get a new gun, customize a car, or get some new threads, these are all expensive luxuries. But once you're a little ways into the game and have a few irons in the fire, all those luxuries become more and more available. That's the cool part. There's nothing really cool beyond this though, no expensive cars or cribs, so this wealth does feel a little bit hollow before too long. The only large purchases are the other ventures, and here's where we hit a snag. At some points throughout the story, even though I would always maximize venture payout first thing, my only option would be to wait on the game to let me have more content. We have just cleared Finale and seen credits, but there are still two missions left. We are at 21 hours of playtime, and it will be 14 more before I can finish them. I completed all of the meaningful content, every side hustle, every wanted, everything. Doesn't matter, I still had to wait 14 hours to finish the game. This is where the economy backfires. Because it wants you to feel the luxury of this passive income, there are no good means to actively build money. And so I waited for 10 hours, putting down the final few ventures so I could access the finale. I got dressed for the occasion, to finally say goodbye to this dog shit game. I got to the table, and I have to wait another three and a half hours! I have to pay for the final mission, which it turns out is paying for a skyscraper. I'm beginning to think the Peter Principle was just shouting out their love for Fable 3. But I did it. In the same part of the city where we shot and killed Nawali, I build Saint's Tower. And my reward? One of the characters from the intro says congratulations. Yay. More than 14 hours out from the last time I'd ever interacted with any of the characters. We've seen a lot lately. You haven't. Done a lot lately. You haven't. Hard to believe there's much of anything left to do. There isn't. And then... If you see a faded sign at the side of the road that says 15 miles to the... the, the I wish you were all dead. 14 hours after any story, somehow expecting a mission, we get an intentionally bad karaoke rendition of Love Shack over a montage of characters I wouldn't have remembered if this had come hot off the heels of the Nawali. I watched this with my face contorted in agony, somehow surprised the game could let me down one last time, realizing that the jokes about karaoke weren't a narrative thread, but a narrative fret. An advancement of the earlier game's car singing sequences. Their acute joke which evolved into a series running gag. Here elevated in importance to a place of pure impotence. A masturbatory celebration of all the game's iconography and non-entities. Were it not for this, I could have called what happened with the Nawali the most narcissistic ending I've ever experienced. But tricking me into waiting 14 hours for this? That tops it. Actually, wait, hang on. Is the church filled with venture side characters because all of those saints we robbed a train for were fucking killed by the guy we broke out for the purpose of robbing a train? That's actually pretty funny, and I didn't really consider it. We got all those people killed. We did all of that to pay them and didn't give a shit when they bit the big one. Thanks for the tower, guys. It's bathed in your blood. Now, while the game is meaninglessly sucking itself to completion, I gotta ask the obvious question. Why the fuck aren't they singing 9 to 5? You know, it's a song which works for, like, some of the story, I guess. Fuck it. Fuck it. We're done. We're done. Game's over. 
That is the worst way it could end. Celebrating itself. But then, it'll be the only one that does. How do I sum up Saints Row the new one? I feel like I've written nothing but conclusion after conclusion because its bad elements are that pungent and numerous. Well, I think I know how to put it. I don't think I've ever played something that feels so desperate to be loved. Saints Row the new one plays like all the rejected ideas from a different game made manifest. Gameplay ideas clunky and eclectic, uncooperative and not meshing together, character arcs scrapped for feeling incomplete or being too inconsequential, phased out repetitive minigames that feel more like ways to test systems than skills, filler missions which got the boot for not contributing to narrative structure or just reiterating character trivia without developing it beyond the starting line. This is a title which is a celebration of leftovers. And playing through these self-proud scraps is an odyssey, like you're playing something trying to find itself in this garbage dump of half-baked ideas. I'm annoyed by, but can understand it pretending to be interested in street art, LARPing, millennial problems, phone apps, employment, the gig economy, but it doesn't even seem interested in what it should be about. It's fake from top to tip. I said I got the sense it wasn't soulless, but a troubled soul. On closer examination, no, just soulless. And I take no joy in that. People hated these characters from moment one. I was not that harsh. I was willing to be won over, as an okay foundation can be spotted in this narrative if you're willing to forgive a lot. But the characters were never going to crawl out of that hole because they're not allowed to climb. They can't progress, develop, or surprise. They're not exactly as they seem, but that's because they turn out worse. The idea of perfection this game has of them is a weight around its ankles. It does things I feel a series could only do for long-established and beloved characters, and it goes to lengths that even those games would be tongue-in-cheek about for fear of coming off as too self-congratulating but it's so proud of these entities that it celebrates them out of the gate and without irony. Saints Row the Third taught me a lot about what I dislike, and I feel this game has done it again. I hate more than anything to feel led on, to see wasted potential, to get no sense of ambition or willingness to really try or commit to anything beyond blowing hot air. I do not recommend this game except as an object of study. Negative backlash may have actually hidden just how much wrong is going on here. This has been Tesnakera. This was one of the worst games I've ever played, and it was endlessly fascinating. At least when I wasn't spending a massive chunk of it idling. If you want to support this channel, please spread this video around. If you want to support me more directly, I have a Patreon. Everyone gets a thank you, they're scrolling by right now. You guys are the real saints. Sorry. The notes are cut off halfway through this time when, partway through writing, I just decided, I know everything I wanted to say. And at $5, you get access to Afterthought videos where I answer viewer questions about the game and any other last minute thoughts. Next up, we're going to play a series that actually has a spark of imagination, and one which I truly adore. I've found the beacon of House Phoenix. The fire is lit. Legions of the Phoenix are on the march. Hold the line and strike true.
House Phoenix. 